And welcome, 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 everybody. We are live worldwide. I am your host, Jim Masters, and this is the Jim Masters Show Live. Good to have you with us. Getting ready to enter week number 11. 5, 10 plus 1 is 11. Could you imagine that? Now, I'm a professional television radio host, personality, presenter. Been doing this for years. As you know, voiceover artist, writer, producer, uh, narrator, stage MC, all that cool stuff in my professional work for many years with television networks, radio stations, public television, more. But 11 weeks ago, as of tomorrow, we launched this. We built the home studio, looking pretty snazzy, huh? And uh, brought in the TV lights and just everything. We put together this cool, fun, light, and engaging, very viewer-centric entertainment lifestyle talk show series, something that many people in the industry and a lot of you asked me to do for the longest time. So now during this time of uh, what's been going on the last couple of months, we had the time to do it. And I'm so glad we did because we've had so many extraordinary guests on the show. But even days when there isn't a guest, which is really rare because we're booked with guests all the way. I can't believe we're booked all the way till mid-September, just about every night with sensational guests from television and film and movies, uh, inspiration, chefs, science, health and wellness experts. It literally is something for everybody on this show. And it's my pleasure to present it to you every single night. A lot of people are saying it's got the modern vibe of today. There's modern sensibilities, but it also has a little old school polish harkening back to some of the ways that hosts used to do the shows. And I'm really, really so honored and happy to hear that. A lot of people are going to be watching tonight because uh, they love the show. There's a lot of regulars. We've built quite a fan base and it continues to expand. And we encourage you to share the links, have watch parties, uh, have a good time. The show is all light love, levity, or the word that we created here, because I slipped up a couple of weeks ago when I was saying the show is about light, uh, levity, and love, and we created the word lovity, and everybody's loving lovity, so we're going to stick with lovity here on the show, and you guys uh, from all around the world, we have viewers, not just in the United States and Canada, but we've got viewers who've been watching uh, in Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, we have regular viewers uh, in Holland and Spain and Ireland and Italy, um, Barcelona, you name it, uh, Perth and Melbourne. And it's amazing. Coast to coast, the United States as well. So it's a pleasure to have you here. We're all snazzy. We're sort of uh, New York or Hollywood or uh, Vegas tonight. And, you know, I always whip out these jackets. And uh, some people have asked, Jim, Jim, you know, I love these jackets. We, look at this thing. <laughs> Can you imagine they have a jacket that actually does stuff like that? That's cool. These jackets I actually wear. Uh, one of my freelance gigs that I do is that I'm a professional MC and host for MGM. And if you might remember, a couple of nights ago, we had Hollywood legend Sky Aubrey on the show, whose father at one time was president of MGM and CBS, and, and she loved one of the jackets we had on. So MGM has been pretty much closed, you know, with everything going on the last couple of months. Everything has been closed. Broadway is closed. We're here in the greater New York City area in the United States between New York and Boston. That's where we uh, generate this show out of. So these jackets that you see me sporting, these sharp jackets, are actually I wear on stage when I MC uh, concerts and, and contests and all kinds of events for the folks at MGM Resorts International. So every once in a while, I sport them here on the Gym Masters Show Live, so we have an opportunity to spark things up. But it's so great to have you here. I just want to do what we do here, and that is, of course, first tell you who's on. You see it right there. Wow, isn't it incredible? This is really cool. I've always been a fan of this gentleman for, for many, many years. And uh, you know who he is. You've seen him on so many shows, so many specials. Just about every talk show there is known to man and womankind, from Carson to, to Leno to Letterman and so much more. He's, he's a brilliant observer of life. He really, really is. And he comes from these real um, blue collar roots. And he's taken that outside Chicago, just on the south side, neighboring suburban town outside Chicago. And he's taken all those sensibilities and he just made a, an extraordinary career out of it all, understanding the human condition in so many different cool ways. Tom Driesen, yes, legendary stand-up comedian and actor and author as well. We're going to be talking about a cool book, Still Standing, that he's a part of, an author. Um, we're very excited to have him here on the show. It really is amazing to have him here on the show. First, as we get ready to welcome uh, 
Tom on the show, we always welcome our audience. We always make sure we acknowledge, and Tom knows this, you always acknowledge your audience, your viewers, the people who are paying the tickets uh, prices. In this case, you're just turning us on and we're here. There's no ticket price. But still, you always um, acknowledge your audience. So Eileen, who happens to be in Australia, says... Hope to see Star, but have a ripper time. I love that Australian expression. As she always says it on our show, have a ripper of a time and love it as well. Good to see you there in uh, the Midlands of just east of Perth, Western Australia. Good to have you with us there, Eileen. Crystal Nolan, who's in Connecticut. Hi, Jim Masters. Looking forward to our fantastic show full of laughter. You got it. That's coming right up. Kathleen Walker, the Queen of Queens in New York City watching tonight. Good to have you with us, Kathleen. I know you're going to love this show. And Avril Britton, who's watching in the United Kingdom, a faithful fan as well, watching all the time. She's here. We appreciate her. You waited up today. You know what happens with our European audience because it's 7 p.m. Eastern here on the East Coast, 4 p.m. Pacific. It's like midnight in England and Willie who watches in Holland, it's like 1 a.m. These people take naps in the day. So they wake up late night. Like she said, I waited up. She didn't even take the nap. She just waited up for our show and my special guest. And that is what you call loyalty. We really appreciate that. Don't forget, we've got our viewer saluting our viewer of the week coming up as well. Good evening, Jim and everyone. Hope all are doing well. Yes, Ernestine in North Carolina. It is amazing to have you here. We appreciate you as well. Kathleen says she hopes everyone's having a good weekend. Linda in Florida says, hello, Mr. Lovety. That's the word that we created. Enjoyed last night's show. Last night was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Uh, can't wait for tonight. Candles were a beautiful touch. Wow. Looking awesome. Thank you very, very much. There are the flowers from Willie in Holland who takes naps in the day and wakes up at 1 a.m. to join us. So again, we always show these to Willie. There you go, Willie. These are those uh, wooden hand-painted tulips we got on a TV shoot in Europe uh, last year. Can't go there now, obviously. So there you are. There is my salute to you. And thanks for uh, joining us once again there in the Netherlands. You're here just about every night. We love it. Uh, in Iowa, Renee. Hi, everyone. Well, good to have you with us as well, Renee. I hope you're enjoying some of that uh, cream and sugar corn that you guys grow. We have butter and sugar here on the East Coast, but you guys in Iowa call it cream and sugar. Sounds really, really good. Uh, hey there. How you doing, Mr. Lovety? Uh, Merlin watching in Inner Kip, Ontario, Canada. It's wonderful to have you here on the Gym Master Show live as well. Hey, Jimbo, always watch My Three Sons on TV Land. Oh, My Three Sons. Yes, Stan Livingston, who was Chip Douglas, you know, of course, with Fred McMurray, William Demarest. He's going to be on the show uh, this Friday, uh, the 24th. It's going to be cool. He's excited. We've been chatting. I'm looking forward to having him on the show as well. If you remember, we had Kathy Garver on a couple of weeks ago. She played Sissy on Family Affair with Brian Keith, Sebastian Cabot, and uh, Johnny Whitaker, and Nissa Jones. And she was also in the Ten Commandments. A lot of people didn't know that. Hi, Jim. Like the jacket. Thank you very much. Happy Sunday. A couple more coming in here. Then we're going to welcome our, illustri welcome our illustrious guest here on the Gym Master Show live. Don't go anywhere. Matter of fact, call all your friends. Call your family. There's nothing else on TV or the internet right now that will top having Tom Driesen on the show, right? <laughs> Absolutely. He's here for you. Hi, Jim Masters. You look like you're ready to burst out in song. Light, levity, levity. You better believe it as well. Jim is here from one gym to the next. Hi, Jim. Saw Tom in Lake Tahoe years ago. Very funny. I've always been a fan of him. I've always, you know, you know, sometimes here, here's one. I'll give you a little behind the scenes thing. Sometimes when you are interviewing somebody or having a conversation with somebody that you admire, but you're in the role of being a host or, you know, an interviewer, whatever it may be, journalist could be whatever it is. Sometimes it is hard for people who are in these roles to not exude over abundance of enthusiasm because, you know, you really admire the person. That happened when I was with Carol Burnett, Florence Henderson, who Tom worked with. He's got a great Florence Henderson story. And some others have had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing uh, professionally, my professional work. Sometimes if you're really big fans of theirs, it's hard not to. So you have that fine line of being a fan and admiring, but also maintaining the professional nature. And I've always tried to do that. But darn it, Tom's here. <laughs> There you go. So yeah, you saw him in Ta Tahoe. That's fantastic. And he is hilarious. You know, I've always watched his work, but all day long in preparation for the show, actually the last two days, I've been watching 
just about everything on YouTube as well. And he is so on point and so funny. Uh, he's always been, but just I was reminded of some things that I saw when they were live and was reminded uh, of them now. You love the jacket. That's terrific. Appreciate that. I'll whip out more of these MGM jackets. Again, th these I do wear on MGM, but lately they've been sitting, you know, on the hangers until MGM reopens. Looking good. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, yes, um, love the sparkly jacket. Your husband has loved Tom. Absolutely. Everybody loves Tom. He's, he's a good guy, too. He's a good guy. Looking forward to an interview. Thank you very much. Karen in Pittsburgh. Good to see you in Pittsburgh. Your mom says hello. I hope your mom's doing well there in Pittsburgh as well. Carla, who's watching in Brazil, she comes on on the weekends usually from Brazil. Good evening, Carla in Brazil. It is awesome to have you here. Uh, tell your friends there in Brazil, we've got an awesome show in store for you. Jacqueline. Hi, Jim and everybody. Good to see you, Jacqueline, you and your family. We, there's the sweet corn from Renee, and thanks for the shout out. Absolutely, and the, many more comments here. We'll go through them later on. But first, I've got to welcome my very special guest. And uh, if you've, if you're in need of a laugh right now, uh, which I think a lot of us are, don't go anywhere because this guy is amazing. First of all, let me show you this shot. I mean, look at that. You know who he's with, right? Well, for like over 13 years, he was the uh, opening act for Frank Sinatra. That's right. But that's, that, I mean, that's a huge part of his uh, career and his life. And he's very proud of that. However, he also has been involved in so many other projects, productions, events, so much more. And we're so honored to have an opportunity to talk to him about this relationship and lots more. What I saw him on one of his uh, interviews earlier today, uh, I don't know if it was Letterman or one of them where he said, no, I think he was on Huckabee, Huckabee on TBN. And it was hilarious. Huckabee had said to him, well, you opened for, you know, it's illustrious. You opened for Frank Sinatra. And he goes, actually, I have a slight correction. Uh, Sinatra closed for me. <laughs> I mean, I love humor like that. That is so funny. And there for, for years on David Letterman, a close friend, even before that, Johnny Carson. And of course, Tim Reed, the relationship he's had with Tim Reed, who you know from WKRP in Cincinnati, uh, the first interracial comedy duo in history in America. And as uh, Tom often says, and the last. <laughs> and they wrote, a fan there's a fantastic book too. I'm gonna to talk about this and so much more. Uh, there they are together. Really, I tell you, and there he is with uh, Sinatra. We're going to talk about these pictures, and there's his book, which we're going to show you again coming up. There's his current book, Still Standing. Uh, he's been a pioneer in stand-up comedy for some 50-plus years, and this book is extraordinary. It's a real inspiring story. As you see, you can see it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstores uh, as well. And here he is when he was hosting David Letterman as well. That's right. Look at that. Fantastic Medal of Honor, and just so much more. I mean, there he is. He's been very supportive of uh, veterans and the military. He's a guy, he's a philanthropist. He's a guy who gives back too, and he loves people that you know give back. There, There's Tim and Tom on Letterman, and of course, years with the Laugh Factory, and here's a cool shot going back in time, you know, just really cool stuff here on the show. So we are so honored to, to welcome him to the show, and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about Tom, because he really is an amazing guy and his background is extraordinary. He's one of the world's groundbreaking, well-respected and beloved entertainers of stage and screen, a living legend in the world of comedy. Tom has made over 500 national television appearances and still does as a stand-up comedian, including more than 60 plus, actually 61 appearances on The Tonight Show as a frequent guest as well on The Late Show with David Letterman. For years, he's been a regular in all the main showrooms in Las Vegas, a favorite national touring act, performing with the artists such as Smokey Robinson, Liza Minnelli, Natalie Cole, Sammy Davis Jr. He even went with um, Mac Davis as well and so many others. I know everybody knows him for uh, his relationship with Sinatra, or Blue Eyes, the chairman of the board, but uh, he's worked with some of the greats. He's got some phenomenal Sammy Davis Jr. stories too, 
one involving a marquee that uh, Sammy wanted Tom's name on and what Sammy did to make that happen. Really cool stuff. Uh, nothing could top Tom's more than 14 years as the opening act for the one and only Frank Sinatra, with whom he came to know as a mentor and a close friend. And that's magic, you know, when that hope happens, folks. You know, you do a gig, you're, you're, you're paired up with somebody, and then you guys become friends, and it goes, it transcends time, and it goes way beyond just the, you know, the matter at hand. Now, for the first time, the complete story of Tom and his wonderful, extraordinary, iconic 50-year career in show business is being told in his personal memoir, Still Standing, My Journey from Streets and Saloons to Stage and Sinatra. The book, published by Post Hill Press and distributed by Simon & Schuster, is now available online, and it was just released. I mean, it's hot off the presses. It was just released uh, in June of 2020. It's really a rags to riches tale still standing behind the scenes story of Tom Driesen's unlikely journey from shining shoes and dark saloons on the south side of Chicago to famously traveling the country as the opening act for the greatest entertainer who ever lived, Frank Sinatra. Along the way, Tom became a pioneer of stand-up comedy for the first six years of his career. Tom shared the stage with Tim Reed, from WKRP in Cincinnati and Frank's Place and so much more as America's first and only black and white comedy team. Together, Tim and Tom broke barriers during the height of racial tensions in the country and built a lifelong friendship and brotherhood that exists to this day. As a solo performer, Tom Driesen continued his, to really hone and fine tune his craft while working to break in as a prime time performer at LA's most famous comedy club, the Comedy Store. And during that time, Tom became close with other aspiring comedians working with the Comedy Store, including David Letterman, Jay Leno, Robin Williams, Elaine Boozler, Freddie Prinze, Michael Keaton, and other stars on the rise at the dawn of the greatest era in the history of stand-up comedy. Later, Tom helped organize and lead a movement of comedians to champion for fairness in how stand-up comics were compensated for performing in LA's most famous comedy clubs, beginning with the Comedy Store. And that successful effort forever changed the fortunes of countless young and funny men and women hoping to earn a living by performing stand-up. During his more than 14 years as Frank Sinatra's opening act, Tom came to know Sinatra on personal terms, as very few others can claim, with their similar backgrounds from small town streets and taverns providing the glue Sinatra once remarked, if I'm a saloon singer and I am then Tommy is a saloon comedian. In other words, with just a couple of neighborhood guys. And now Still Standing chronicles this special relationship with Frank in a way that no other memoir has done before. Tom's story is one of overcoming long shot odds, enduring the hardships of being one of eight kids, literally living in a shack style house, uh, surviving the turmoil of a family led by two alcoholic parents, and ultimately finding his way off the streets onto the world's biggest stages. You know, if you ever look at the lives of comedian, comedians and comedians, a lot of them, they come from backgrounds of strife and, and, and of loss and things of that nature and uh, have this unbelievable uncanny way to work through it in their own lives through comedy, which inspires us to get through the troubles and tribulations and trials of our own lives. And Tom has mastered that. He's appeared in numerous motion pictures too. Trouble with the Curve, Spaceballs, Man on the Moon, and HBO movies, The Rat Pack, and Lansky. He also mastered roles on classic television, including Columbo, Touched by an Angel, Murder, She Wrote, Facts of Life, WKRP in Cincinnati, and more. And he recorded a comedy album, which is uh, a legend, uh, That White Boy is Crazy, becoming the only white comedian to record an album in front of an all-black audience. Tom, the boy from Harvey, Illinois, has never forgotten where he came from. He returns to the south side of Chicago, often to see his friends and family and to mark the span of his journey and good fortune. A proud humanitarian, Tom also made an indelible mark through his decades of philanthropic activities, lending his talent to over 100 charitable organizations and as founder of one of his own, uh, Day for Darlene, to benefit multiple sclerosis research in honor of his late sister. He's also a veteran of the U.S. Navy and a strong supporter of the U.S. military. Tom has also performed for U.S. troops around the world. And to commemorate this noble work, in 2005, he received the prestigious Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award, which is that photo we just showed moments ago. And uh, that was for his humanitarian service to the United States of America. What a beautiful thing to do. Tom is currently appearing in theaters. Of course, you know, when 
all of this situation uh, slows down, he'll be back in those theaters around the country. He's got his one-man show, An Evening of Laughter and Stories of Sinatra, displaying his critically acclaimed comedy skills with extraordinary storytelling ability. And that's what it is. It is storytelling. One quick thing, if you get a chance ever in your life to see Tom perform on stage at a theater, concert venue, what have you, do it, do it, I recommend. Recognized again for his legacy of career spanning work and known as one of Hollywood's true gentlemen. And there's been a shortage of that as well. And uh, you know, I think being a gentleman is a great thing and I'm sign me up, I believe in that big time. Tom has earned his status as a legend in the entertainment industry, still standing again, the book is his story and his story is one for the ages. So he is my very, very special guest this evening for the entire evening together. We're gonna to have a wonderful conversation and somebody else that's here, as you know, we have George Burns on the show. If you, or if you're just watching for the first time, George is always a part of the show. We did a nostalgic week a couple of weeks ago, brought out childhood toys and everything else. My aunt Lillian, who's no longer with us, collected dolls and on his 100th birthday, this was a commemorative doll that came out. There he is with the cigar. So we show it all the time. There he is. He sees everybody around the world, you and you and you. He joins me every night on the show, no matter what the topic is. Sort of my Ed McMahon, comedy legend here as well. And a couple more characters we always have. Now, if I don't mention these characters, our audience says, where are the characters? Again, the show's about light, levity, lovity. Jeannie's there. Can you see her in the bottle? She's blinking at you. She's saying hello and welcoming all of you from around the world. And I know also you guys want to see Silver. So Silver is here. We got him on a TV shoot in Europe last year. So there's Silver, your Silver Lab. He sees all of you as well. He says hello. And again, the show is all about levity, light, love, the whole bit. And one more cast of characters that goes back to my childhood that all of you guys ask for and you guys love. If I don't do a show without him, everybody will be like, where is he? Jimmy, Jimmy's here <laughs> and Jimmy says hello as well. Again, talk about levity. Look at that face. Since we did our studio upgrade, he's almost like 3D now. Um, if I'm under the weather or not, uh, you know, I'm on vacation or something, I think I'll have Jimmy host the show. What do you think? I think Jimmy, Jimmy likes that idea. I think Jimmy would be a perfect candidate to host the show. So everybody, welcome. It's time to welcome our illustrious guest. He's waiting in our beautifully attired green room. We've been uh, giving him all kinds of champagne, lobster, cheese, and crackers, and fine chocolates uh, from Europe. So he's been uh, consuming all of that while waiting uh, in the wings. Uh, do you really believe that? <laughs> he probably just finished a tuna melt and he's drinking milk or something. <laughs> Let's welcome our very special guest. It's truly an honor. Uh, Tom Driesen here exclusively on the Gym Master Show Live. Tom, hey. welcome to the show. <laughs> Jimmy, listen, we're out of time, but thank you very much for all that introduction. <laughs> That's it. That's that it. might be the greatest introduction I've ever had in all 50 years in show business. Oh. I, you know, what happens, no matter how many years you've been in, in performing and stand-up comedy, when you hear an introduction like that, you go, I don't know if I can follow that introduction. <laughs> Is <laughs> okay. that, that me? I did that. I did that. It brings it all back for you, right? <laughs> yes. When, when, when you held up George Burns, you know, he was a friend and I did the Dean Martin roast with George. In fact, we roasted George when I was a, a young comedian. But uh, I'll tell you a couple of quick stories why I love them. One was when he was 95 years old, uh, Caesar's Palace offered him a five-year contract and he turned it down. Mm -hmm. He said because he wasn't sure Caesar's would be around in five years. <laughs> And, and the the uh, when he, what an inspiration he's been for me. Mm -hmm. I went to see him one time. I was appearing at Harrah's in Lake Tahoe uh, with Sammy Davis Jr. And George was next door at Caesars in Lake Tahoe. And I ran over to catch his last show. He was 95 years old. He didn't run out to the microphone. But when he got out there, he did a strong hour and 10 minutes. And after the show, I went backstage to see him. And uh, in, he it went to his dressing room. And he was looking at some notes, some three by five cards. And I said, hey, George, how you doing? And he looked up from the notes. He said, oh, hi, Tommy. He said, I was working on some new material tonight. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be 95 years old working on new material. And, and it's always been my inspiration ever since. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And nothing stolen from Henny Youngman or Milton Berle either. <laughs> Those guys. Who stole from each other. You know? Right. So let, let's way, go. That, yeah. That's an interesting concept before we jump on. Yeah, yeah. In my day, 
in, in the day of that vaudeville, I mean, there were a lot of material that was alike. A lot of comedians were doing each other's kind of material, different jokes, more jokes, two guys going to a bar. Yeah, yeah. When John Carson came along and we had to go on The Tonight Show in order to make it, you, you uh, had to come up with original monologues. He didn't want two guys going to bar kind of comedians. He wanted comedians who wrote original monologues. So when you did get some precious material that really worked, if somebody took it from you, it was like Rodney Dangerfield said, it was like stealing one of your children. So we were very, very aware of whose material was whose. And we protected one another by, if you saw a young comedian saying, uh, you know, hey, uh, you know, saw Jim Masters and he's doing a joke that you know that belonged to Dave Letterman. You'd pull Jim aside and say, Jim, you know, Dave's doing a bit like that, too. You know, so it was who did it first kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyhow. So let's talk about the background. I mentioned that you grew up in Harvey, Illinois, just outside city of Chicago, blue collar town and uh, Irish on one side, Sicilian, Italian on the other side. How did growing up, you know, in a scrappy town, blue collar town influence the kind of comedy that you've been known for and sort of that trajectory that you took in the comedy world, Tom? Well, you know, I came, I had eight brothers and said, Harvey, by the way, is a suburb on the south side of Chicago, 147 south of the loop of the city. And, um, but um, I'm reading your notes while this coming here. But yeah. anyway, I had eight brothers and sisters and we were very poor. We lived in a shack. You know, we had no bathtub and no shower and no hot water. It was a rat infested, roach infested shack. And uh, I shined shoes in taverns. I set pins in bowling alleys. I caddied in the summertime. I sold newspapers. And I had a paper out all to help feed my brothers and sisters. Um, and none of this do I regret. I always say that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because all of life is about perception. It's how you perceive it to be. And I perceive that to be a blessing because it helped build character that years later when I was struggling and going through tough times, even in show business, you know, I remembered the struggle I had as a young guy. So it, it always worked out real good for me, you know, and, uh, and I, and when I, one of the taverns that I shined shoes in all the time was when, when my mother was a bartender and my uncle owned the bar and he would tell jokes behind the bar. Mm. My mom's sister's husband, it was my mother's sister's husband. And I found that fascinating that this guy, he had everybody in the bar laughing. He could tell a story and with his vocabulary, with his timing, with his inflection, this sound to come out of everybody's body and totally in, you know, just like electricity through the yeah. air and unite yeah. everybody. Yeah. It was just fascinating to me that he could do that. And I began to emulate him. And I, I would tell a lot of his jokes, many that should not be told on a Catholic school <laughs> playground. <laughs> right. and, and, and so, you know, that growing up, that, that there was a mantra in my neighborhood when I was growing up that you only deserve in life what you work for. Mm -hmm. The mantra, you only deserve in life what you work for. And That's so right. I learned from a boy that if, if it is to be, I read a book years later that said, a philosophy book, but it said, if it is to be, it's up to me. And that was my mantra, my whole childhood. I knew that my parents, there was no way they were going to be able to send me to college. There was no way that, that they were going to do anything that, you know, if I, had, if I was going to get something, I had to go out and get it myself. <clears throat> and so that's what my childhood taught me. And, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I never, ever regretted one minute of that poverty or of those hearts. Yeah. Right. First of all, exactly. There are no failures, you know. You don't fail in life. All of that's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. So when it doesn't work, you don't put your head down and go, oh, I failed. No, you didn't fail. You learned something that you won't do that again. So, exactly. every, so it's just a great journey. It's been a great journey. So, so tell us about some of those early uh, steps that you took. Obviously, you, you had that opportunity to be surrounded by some of that early on, which really you soaked in and it influenced you. And I, I attribute a lot of what I saw, you know, my family, my father and relatives do that sort of sparked my trajectory as well, just in terms of their personalities and who they are and who they were. Um, tell us about some of those uh first steps you took to really pursue coming from that, you know, environment, how you were able to then get into the comedy world. What were some of the things that you were doing early on that started pointing you in that direction, Tom? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, two things I'll attribute to me eventually I, uh, becoming successful, but I, I went through a lot of hard years where I wasn't successful and doing a lot of things wrong, but two things, the foundation of my life, six years old, I went to Catholic school. Um, my, my mom sent me to Catholic school. Now, I, my dad was an alcoholic. He drank all the time. A nice man, a docile guy. But he 
he was in the bars all the time drinking. So that was his first priority. And so he, he wasn't a real close father to me, nor my other brothers and sisters. So when I was a young boy going to Catholic school, the nuns kept teaching me that there was a father I had in heaven. And that if I prayed to that father, you know, and the nun said, well, you know, his son came here to tell us about his father and, and even taught us the prayer, you know, the Lord's prayer. So as a little boy, that was so fascinating. I was six years old. I thought, you mean I have a father in heaven? And I would pray to that father in heaven, whatever I had problems as a little boy. So that was the foundation of my life of believing in, in a, that I had a higher power and someone I could go to when I was on my, on my knees, you know, and, and uh, literally on my knees, you know. But anyhow, that foundation. The second, I was a high school dropout. When I was 16 years old, I dropped out of high school because I was ashamed of the way I was going to school with holes in my shoes and raggedy clothes. And I worked in bowling alleys till I was 17. When I was 17, I joined the Navy. Once I got in the Navy, I got a high school diploma from the Navy and I went to junior college nights and everything. But I started reading every book I could find on positive mental attitude. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking, A Guide to Confident Living, um, Maxwell Maltz, Psycho, Psycho, Psycho Cybernetics. I read um, the, a book that really, uh, a Positive Mental Attitude and all the Dale Carnegie books, but a book that really helped me was called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. And I began reading those books. And that's what helped me start thinking that maybe I could be more than just, you know, because my dream as a little, when you're a little kid growing up, my dad spent all of his money in the bars. So I thought that the owner of a tavern was the epitome of success, you know. And so uh, all the saloons in my neighborhood, the men who owned the taverns were like stars in the neighborhood. And after I started reading these books, I thought maybe I could be more than just a bartender. You know, maybe I could become. So that formed my foundation. When I came out of the service, I wandered aimlessly. I took one job after I, I got into getting married. I had one child. I had two children. Now I have three children. And I'm still, I'm going from, I was a private detective. I was a, a truck driver. I loaded trucks on a loading dock. I was a Teamster union guy. I dropped my union card and became a foreman of the company. Um, I worked with my brother as a photographer. I also I ended up selling life insurance. But I would, none of those jobs was that I feel like, like, I, like that's what I was supposed to be doing. I would catch myself being in the bar at 2 o'clock in the morning, buddies, <clears throat> drinking. And I kept thinking, I don't belong here. But I didn't know where I belonged. And, and I would pray, you know, God, what you must be something that I'm supposed to be doing. This can't be it. I ended up joining a civic group called the JCs. In those days, it was called the Junior Chamber of Commerce. And they attacked problems of the community. And if there were problems in the community you lived in, they attacked those problems by you learn how to serve on a committee, how to chair a committee, uh, and, and leadership training, you know. And so one of the problems in our community was drugs in our youth. And I wrote a drug education program teaching grade school children the ills of drug abuse with humor. It was a concept I had that getting the kids laughing. You know, uh, they weren't teaching drug education in those days at a college level or high school level, let alone at an elementary school level. But I knew we had to get to the kids early. Again, keep in mind, I'm praying, saying, God, what is it I'm supposed to be doing in life? This can't be it. <clears throat> the first night I proposed this project to the JCs as, to run it as to him, then to sanction it and run it as a JC project. A young black guy comes up to me after the meeting and said, gee, I'd like to work with you on that project. I think that's interesting. Keep in, keep in mind, I, again, I was praying for what am I supposed to be doing in life? So I said to him, I'm sorry, I already got a guy, a white guy named John DeBoer. And he, thank you. The next day, my white friend, John DeBoer, said, gee, I can't do that with you, Tom. I got a new job. And I said, what was that black guy's name? Oh, yeah, Tim Reed. I said, and Tim was a marketing representative. E.I. DuPont had recruited him out of Norfolk State College into Chicago as a marketing rep. And he joined the JC. Anyhow, we start working on the project. The program, we went into the classrooms. And the moment we hit that classroom, I knew what a blessing it was that I met this man, Tim Reed, because the students were black and white. And the students responded to us immediately. We were young guys. We played records. We made that playing off getting the kids laughing, and then we planted the seeds of the ills of drug abuse. The program became so successful, JC Chapters use it as a model program in 50 states and in 22 foreign countries through their publications. One day, a little eighth grade girl walking out of the class said, you guys are funny. You ought to become a comedy team. And the thought of a black-white comedy team intrigued us because no one had ever done that before. So we set writing what we thought was material, and uh, there were no comedy clubs in those days, none. So we had to work all black clubs in the North and the South, you know, uh, what they affectionately call the Chitlin circuit, black owned, black operated nightclubs. 
where I'd be the only white guy within miles. Then we worked all white night clubs with Tim would be the black guy. And it, it, it was an experience like you couldn't believe it. We lasted six years. America wasn't ready for us, but we were ready for them. And, uh, and we, were, we, we weren't politically correct either. We went after any stereotype, but we had so much fun, paid a lot of dues, a lot of dues that other acts have never had to pay. Uh, but in the end, we're still the best. That was the first picture, by the way, you're showing on the screen that we ever took. We were so naive. We thought we had to have tuxedos. You know, we look at that picture. <laughs> and yeah. And we start laughing every time we see that picture, you know. But uh, we wrote a book, as you pointed out, uh, called Tim and Tom, an American Comedy in Black and White. And uh, now we're, uh, we're pitching things that might possibly. Yeah, that was Tim and I on stage. Uh, by the way, one of the routines we did in those days, I was interviewing the first black president of the United States. That was 50 years ago. Mm. I'm the first black president of the right. United States. Right. One, of our, one of our lines was, I said, uh, now that you're president, what's the first thing you're going to do? He said, the first thing I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to uh, uh, help Congress pass a law that dead people are not allowed to vote in Chicago. <laughs> I said, another thing, I said, what's the second thing you're going to do? He said, well, the second thing I'm going to do is have Congress pass a law that live people aren't allowed to vote in Mississippi, you know. And uh, that, that was the kind of stuff we, <laughs> we did. Uh, we, did we, just, yeah. it was, we had so much fun, uh, paid dues. They actually stayed together six years, and yeah. we're still the best friends to this day. It's really amazing, too. And when, when you think about that, you guys were really groundbreaking. Um, and it's it's sort of opened up things maybe for other people to be able to take chances as well, wouldn't you say, Tom? Well, you know, again, in those days, you didn't see a black guy and a white guy walking down the street together, let alone on a stage together. Right. One of the things I'll take to my grave, and Tim Reed will agree to the same thing. I can't tell you how many times. Now, first of all, there were race riots all over the United States yeah. and every city, including Harvey, Illinois, which had one of the largest in the country. And also, students were protesting the Vietnam War. The, America was in turmoil. In the middle of all this, we were going, wherever there was racial tension, we were trying to make a, a laugh. You know, we went to high schools where there was racial tension, colleges. We went to, we did 11 prisons in one year. Uh, wherever there was racial tension, not, we didn't preach. We just wanted to make people laugh. Right. I can't tell you how many times, Jim, that after a show, a young kid would come up to us, a black kid, and he would say, I've got a white friend that I'd like to reach out to. He said, but if I do, the brothers are going to wear me out. But after watching you and Tim having so much fun today, I'm going to reach out to my white friend. Then a white kid would come up to us and say, you know, I got a black friend that I want to reach out to. But if I do, you know, the white guy's going to give me a bad time. He said, but watching you and Tim, I'm going to do that. I can't tell you how many times that happened to us. The people today would say, well, that's strange. I have a, I have a black friend. I have an Asian friend. I have a white friend. In our day, that was, that was uh, un, un, you know, yeah, rare. Yeah, right. So I, I, I don't care about any award. And, and I got a room full of awards from yours. Nothing means more to me than those kind of statements. That, that's what... Sometimes I think maybe that's what I was put on this planet for, Tim and I. And, uh, and like I say, not only are we best of friends of this day, his children call me Uncle Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your Uncle Tom. Yeah, great comments coming in. Always love seeing Tom. He's a great storyteller, talented man. You have that in common along with great heads of hair. We've got great heads of hair, Joyce Logan says. Thank you, Joyce. We love you. <laughs> Joyce, by the way, I had nothing to do with this hair. That's Irish Italian background, you know. My tell my, 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 tell my, us my friends story. that I go Yeah. <laughs> tell us a story about, about this, what's oh. happening here. Well, what happened was I'll shave twice a day. I, when I was in the Navy, I was 17 years old. When I was Navy, I've been shaving my whole life. A while back, I had to do, before the, the pandemic thing, I had they asked me to do a film as a Baptist minister. And I thought, gee, he would look good with the beard. So I was going to grow a gray beard. Because my hair is great. Well, it came in dark. Now, and then I later, two weeks later, I played a priest in a film and kept it. Kept it. Now, my friends at the golf course keep saying, "Oh, come on, you're dyeing your face. That's not your hair." But it really is my hair. That's my, you know. Uh, but anyhow, going back to, to to the hair. When I go to class reunions, my buddies always uh, they they think, "Come on, you're wearing a toupee." I said, "No, I'm, that's really my hair." That's your hair. Grew up watching the late shows. Always enjoyed seeing Tom. It's like, hello to an old friend. Hello, Tom from Linda in Florida, which is Hi, really, Linda. really nice. And uh, Willie's the one that stays up late for our show. She's in Holland. She goes to bed and then wakes up at 1 a.m. when the show starts uh, in her time in the Netherlands. And she says, I didn't know you, but I've seen you on YouTube and you're very funny. So she found well, you 50 years later. 
Thank you, Willie. You know, I, I wonder, you know, I can put a little more light on me. Am I shaded here or is the light okay, Jim? Uh, you look good. Maybe just a little bit like you just came out of uh, the sun or something. A little sunburn there. Why, do you have a little more light? You want to throw some? Hold, Hold on lights? one second. Let me yeah, catch lights, camera, action. Yeah. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Jim Masters, and we are chatting with the extraordinary and the legendary Tom Driesen. That's right. That's a little more light. That's right. Tonight, you're a sit-down comic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So... I I do play a lot of golf, so I got I was you know got red the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what have you been doing? Speaking of golf, what have you been doing to get through all the crazy times that we have been dealing with, Tom? You know, if we've ever needed the arts and or comedy, it, it is now. Because I've said that everything that we've been experiencing since February, March, the only two people that could have scripted anything like this would have been Stephen King or Steven Spielberg. It's so extreme. Yeah. Maybe Rod Serling too. What have you been doing to, to get through your writing and your, your, you know, staying connected with fans? How are you doing? Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm right. I'm always comedians that I don't think you could become a successful comedian today in our industry. And there's thousands more comedians today than there were when I started out, unless you're a writer. If you can, you, you know, you, you could get by for a little while, but you, you have to, if you're going to be, uh, go the distance, you, you got to learn how to write your own material. So I, I know how to write jokes and I do that a lot, you know, and um, hi, Karen. Iani, I think that's Iani. It's on Iani, Pittsburgh. yeah, from Pittsburgh. Yes, and, and I work Pittsburgh many times, too, a great city to do shows in. But, I, but anyhow, so I've been writing material. And then, I, as you know, I'm a motivational speaker. I yes. talk on subjects, perception, visualization, self-talk, and develop a sense of humor. So sometimes I'll go on my Facebook, and I'll, I'll just uh, set, I'll, I'll give maybe a three- or five-minute uh, positive uh, message for today, you know. So I, I do that, and uh, and and then you know again this this book has taken off. This book still standing, my journey from streets and saloons to the stage and Sinatra. It, it's on Amazon.com. Where it, it, it's I can't tell you how much I'm doing shows like this constantly from morning, noon, and night, and people are are, are you know responding and the reviews on Amazon have been fantastic. There she is. So tell us about the book. The book really must have been a true labor of love for you. I know it really, uh, you know, talks about your extraordinary career, the, you know, the ups, the downs, the relationship with Sinatra, so much more. Uh, what was your first thought about writing this book? Because it's not always an easy process to, to put it all down, to get it all organized and then let it flow. So what were those first inspirations for you, Tom, to actually compile all this and share it with all the rest of us? <laughs> Did you fall asleep? <laughs> his, uh, his Wi-Fi might be a little tricky there. Thomas, <laughs> let's see, Tom, 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 you there, Tom? Let's see if he's, uh, oh, he disappeared. Could you imagine that? We'll have to see if we can get him back on. But let's, while he's doing that, he'll get back on. He has the, uh, the things that he needs. Let's take a look at some of the photos and then we will, uh, we will get him back on in just a second. I tell you, it's uh, it's technology for you. It's not exactly like we're in a television studio, radio show, or a uh, stage. We're dealing with the internet and all the uh, foibles and technology of the internet. All right. Again, let's talk about the book. We see the book here. Tom Driesen has been a pioneer in stand-up comedy for some 50 plus years. This is his inspiring story. It is available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, local bookstores. Here's another shot of the book. Really, really cool. And he's back. <laughs> hey, you're I back, you're that back. Was that Welcome or back. Or it might've been on yours. You just sort of, you froze and then dis disappeared. So I just, I just- You know, I, I wonder, I just vamped. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a, it's a great, you know, they said you call Phil. I wonder <laughs> if I could, uh, I can hook up another cord here that might make it work. How do you shut your Wi-Fi off on this? Um, on your Because I think if I, well, we might be fine now. We let it go before we, uh, 
Yeah, we hopefully will be. So we were talking about the book and we we're talking about some of the, uh, I, I was telling everybody, this isn't exactly like television, radio or on stage. You're dealing with the foibles and craziness of the internet where anything can happen. It's a whole new, it's the wild, wild west plus two these days with the internet. Uh, we were talking about the book and sort of the inspirations for writing the book. Well, what, what, you know, my whole life, I've, and I, I ask, I tell everybody to do this journal, you know, everywhere I went where I would, um, uh, when I was touring with Sammy or touring with Frank, if something that night happened that I thought was funny or poignant, I would write it down when I went back to my room. So I kept these stories for years and, and I've been filing them and putting them. And then uh, about two years ago, I get a call from Johnny Russo and Darren Grubb and they said, we'd like to do a book on you we think a book on your life would be interesting and i said you know i've already really i've written what i thought was a book and and but i need help with the narrative and things like that and so i would send them my chapters and then they would we, we would work on each chapter and but i said well, one thing i want to make sure that everything in that book are my words because i would want ever to say to somebody they'd say gee i read your book and you said this and i i didn't want to ever say no i didn't say that if it's my book i said it so and that's what it is. It's very candid. There's some things in the book that, that um, uh, people wouldn't know about me or know about what happened. But I was very candid about some of the incidents. But it's my journey. It, it's my journey. Basically, for those listening who just tuned in, maybe, basically what this is, is it's a story of a little boy with a shine box, trudging through the snow, going to, from bar to bar, shining shoes in bars, to get money to help feed his brothers and sisters. And while he's in these bars, Frank Sinatra is singing on the jukebox. Mm -hmm. And every one of these bars, Frank Sinatra is singing. And one day, that little boy from Harvey, Illinois, the, is, carries Frank Sinatra's coffin out of a church in Beverly Hills, California. So it's a journey from that little boy from Harvey, Illinois, you know, to, to uh, hearing Sinatra on the jukebox there, to one day carrying his coffin, like I say, out of Beverly Hills, California. And I spoke at his funeral as well. I know, and, I and know. It's not true, all the I, things that happened in between, the hardships that happened in between, where I was knocked down a lot of times physically and literally. Mm -hmm. Knocked down, getting back up. Yeah. And so the title is still standing. And also, uh, I'm, I'm been a, I've been a stand-up comedian for 50 years, so it's a double entendre. It's really amazing. And, and you were with him uh, through thick and thin, Frank Sinatra, even with him, you know, visiting him on those last few days, right? which must have been really emotional. It was because, you know, at first when I started touring with Frank Sinatra, he was the boss. This tour, we, we you know, this is a whole new world of rarefied air. We're flying in this private jet all over the world. We're opening, doing shows for 20,000 people in arenas. In Hawaii, 40,000 people, you know. So in the beginning, he was the boss because it was his tour and you had to do it the, 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 his way, you know. And because it was his tour. So, and he knew everybody's job and, and he, and he the, every night was a command to him, you know, so you didn't slough off on the show. You want to party all night long, that's fine. But showtime, you had to know your job. So he was the boss. But as time went by, when he gained, uh, I think, a little more respect for what I did as a comedian, and he always, he loved comedians, by the way, but he, we became pals now, buddies. Now, as years went by, as he got older, he became like a father to me and he gave me a lot of advice. And so in the end of his life, I would visit him all the time when he didn't have long to live and spend time with him and, and learn lesson after lesson. I'll tell you a quick story. On his 82nd birthday, he died five months later. On his 82nd birthday, we were all around his house. Uh, we went there and uh, they, we had dinner, his friends and, and, uh, and him, and they were waiting for the cake to come out. And sitting around with Gregory Peck and his wife, Veronique, it was Kirk Douglas and his wife, Anne. Um, it was uh, Jack Lemon and his wife, Felicia. It was uh, uh, Robert Wagner, Joe St. John, Angie Dickinson, all these wonderful friends of his. And someone started making small talk for the cake to come out. Somebody said, um, you know, uh, where, do, where, where do you think is the best place to live? And Gregory Peck said, well, Veronique and I have a villa in France and we like it there. And, and uh, um, um, Robert Wagner and Joe St. John said, we have a place in Aspen and we like it there. And Frank, with his head off to the side, like he wasn't quite with us, Frank put his head down and he said, the best place to live is where your friends are. Mm. And everybody went, oh, whoa. My point of this story is here's a man who arguably the greatest career show business has ever known. Academy Awards, Grammys, 
all these you know awards and amassed a fortune and in the end it wasn't about any of those things it was about friends that's the last lesson frank sinatra ever taught me hmm. it's amazing isn't it i mean you know there was something else too i either saw in an interview or, or i read where there was a woman that i think came up to him and, and you guys and and it was backstage and she had mentioned something about her husband being ill can I, can I please, you know, uh, get an autograph because he's in, you know, almost on his bed, deathbed and, and he, something about Frank's cufflinks. I'll let you tell the story on that. Okay. What happened was we were actually coming out of the Waldorf story in New York. You know, Frank, that's another story where he would only stay at a certain place, but he stayed at the Waldorf story in New York and we were leaving to go do a show and we were going out the back entrance because if Frank went out the front, he'd be mobbed. So yeah. security was rushing him. We were going to the limousine and, a, a woman jumped out of the doorway. A, a doorman told me she'd been hiding there for five hours. As we were getting in the limo, she started screaming, Mr. Sinatra, please, Mr. Sinatra, please. And Frank, the security was holding the woman back. And Frank stopped finally and he went back to her. He said, what is it? And she said, my husband is home ill. He's very, very ill. And if I could get an autograph from you, it would mean the world to him. Could I please get it? He said, sure. And he sang the autograph. She said, oh, what beautiful cufflinks. And they were really, really expensive cufflinks, over a thousand dollars. I, I, but anyway, I know where he got them. But she said, "What beautiful cufflinks!" She said, "Thank you." And he took the cufflinks off and he handed them to her. She said, "Give these to your husband." She said, "No, no, no, no! I don't yeah. want them. I'm just admiring them." And he said, "No, I want your husband to have them." Now we get in the limo and we're driving away. I said, "Frank, that was beautiful, but why did you do that?" He said, "Tommy, if you possess something that you can't give away, then you don't possess it. It possesses you." And I never forgot that. That was another lesson Frank Sinatra taught me. In the car later on, he said, you know, nothing we have is ours. We're only using it. He said, Aristotle Onassis, this multi-billionaire, the second he died, all those private jets were not his, that yacht wasn't his, the mansion that he lived in, nothing was his. It transferred. So we don't own anything. We're only using it, even the money in your pocket. So, And he not only taught that talk, he walked that talk. You had to be very careful around him. If you were his friend, you could not say, uh, what a lovely watch. He'd take the watch off and he'd hand it to you. Wow. You couldn't say, oh, what a painting. He'd take it off the wall and hand it to you. And hand it to you as well. Yeah. You had, had to be very careful around him, his friends, to say that they wanted something. Because material things and possessions meant nothing to him, nor did money. He really, mm. he tipped $100. I'll tell you a funny story. If you brought him a cup of coffee, you got $100. If you got a... a a, brought him a pack of camels. He got a hundred dollars. A jack, jack and a splash was his drink. He'd fold it up and slip it to them. One day, coming out of Mame San restaurant in Los Angeles, the valet Parker pulled up his car. The valet Parker, Frank said to the valet Parker, "What's the biggest tip you ever got?" And the kid said, "A hundred dollars." And Frank took two one hundred dollar bills and gave it. To him. Frank said, "By the way, who gave you the hundred dollars?" He said, "You did last Friday, Mr. Sinatra." Mm. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. I tell you, you know, I love another story. Uh, I'm going to circle around back to the relationship with Sinatra, but you also forged a wonderful relationship with Sammy Davis Jr. And there was a time when you were going to be performing with Sammy. And um, I think it was the hotel itself that said, look, Sammy, you know, you're the star. We want your name on, you know, the marquee. Uh, we're not going to have Tom's necessarily on it. And Sammy actually stepped up and fought for you to make sure your name was uh, accompanying his on the uh, marquee there in Vegas, which is incredible. Tell us about that story. Well, he, you know, Sammy, the, the way it happened was we were pulling into Las Vegas. First of all, when I first did my first appearance on the Tonight Show, that changed my life. In those days, wherever you went in America, somebody say, what do you do for a living? You say, I'm a stand-up comedian. The next question out of the mouth was, oh, yeah, you ever been on Johnny Carson? If you hadn't been on Johnny Carson in the eyes of America, you just weren't a comedian. You might want to be one. You might going to be one, but you weren't one now. So that it took a long time to get on that show. And after that first appearance, my life changed. I was doing Dinosaur, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Johnny Carson, Midnight Special, Rock Concert, Soul Train. I was the only white comedian ever do Soul Train. I was doing all these shows, $20,000 Pyramid at Hollywood Square. Gym. But there was a show I wanted to do called Sammy and Company. Sammy Davis Jr. had a TV show called Sammy and Company that he shot out of Lake Tahoe, out of Harris and Lake Tahoe. And I did the show and, and did a routine about growing up playing basketball on an all black basketball team. I did all those routines about, and Sammy 
fell off the couch laughing. He said to me, then I'm taking you on the road with me. And he took me on the road. Now we're touring all over the country and we're in Chicago. And he said to me, have you ever worked Las Vegas? And I said, no. He said, well, you open there with me in January. Now I'm driving in the limousine, landing in Las Vegas, never worked there before. We're going down the strip and there's, you know, coming in the Caesars and they were, the guys were on the scaffold putting up the names on the marquee. And Sammy said to them, make sure he gets out of the car. He's told the limo driver, stop the car. And he's yelling at the guys and the guys turn around this, putting up the sign and said, oh my God, he said, Sammy Davis. And he's telling the guy on the other side of the sign, L, L, got Sammy Davis down here. So then, Sammy, we're putting your name up here. And Sammy said, I know, put Tommy's name up there. And the guy said, we, he had the order. The, the sign guy said, this is what they told us to do, Sammy. He said, hey, it's my marquee. It's my marquee. You know, you put it in Tommy's name and put it up there big so everybody can see it. So he get now most stars didn't have the opening act on the on the marquee, you know, uh, because you, you, they put they put their name up there so big. But Sammy had been an opening act and he knew what that was like. So he made sure that my first time in Las Vegas that they gave me billing. He said, because Tommy, whoever you work with here afterward, you we set a precedent. Your name is on the marquee now. They have to do the same for you, at least as big as I put it up there. Now we go inside and we're at rehearsal and the, the conductor there, or the, I mean, the entertainment director, Nat Brandywine, he said to me, to Tommy, you'll do 20 minutes. Sammy, you do an hour and 10. We do 90 shows here. Mm. Well, they served dinner at Caesars in those days. The comedian went into the toilet. The comedian bombed. You're trying to make people after eating food. Waiters and waitresses are going in and out. It was disaster. Mm. Caesars office rooms to work. Anyhow, because they have a high ceiling. Comedians don't like a light high ceiling. We like a low right. ceiling. Right. After a sound, it hits the yeah. ceiling. Right. The acoustics, right. Yeah. So Desert Inn, Sands, great hotels. The Riviera, great hotels. The Golden Nugget. All those places I worked at because they were intimate. But Caesars was a, a big barn. And they serve food. So Sammy said to him, no, Nat. He said, I'll come first. Because Tommy, it's his first time here, he needs to score. All the critics will be in the audience. In those days, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, all the Las Vegas papers. He said, Tommy needs to score. So I'll come out first, and I'll sing three or four songs so the room is clear. And then I'll bring Tommy out. Yeah. Now, the waiters and waiters, the, ladies and gentlemen, Sammy Davis walked out. The waiter's job, they're supposed to have that food cleared before the star comes out. So now when Sammy comes out, the waiters and waiters see Sammy, they're running around taking food away from people who haven't even started eating. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Sorry, now, sir, let me have that fork. <laughs> yeah, so now, you know, uh, now, by the way, if you ever work a showroom where they serve food, they don't laugh. They point the fork at you like this. You you know, you're, you're, they get food in their mouth. They don't laugh. They go, mmm, mmm. They point the fork at you. So now, now Sammy, now after four songs or so, he's got this room in the palm of his hand. And then he brought me out. Mm -hmm. He said, ladies and gentlemen, you've been with me for years. My audience, you've been with me for the up, up times and the bad times, and you've stuck with me. And I appreciate that. He said, whenever you have friends like that, you want to do something for them, like maybe bring them a gift. I got a gift for you. I saw this young boy on my show. That's the way Sammy introduced you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, I walk out every night and I'd say, all my life I dreamed that I'd work Las Vegas. And I dreamed it would be Caesar's Palace. But I never dreamed that Sammy Davis Jr. would be my opening act. And, and they would, Sammy would laugh and they would laugh, you know. But that, that's what he did for me. He was a wonderful guy. So all these uh, times that you've had with Frank Sinatra, and I love that line that I said during the introduction, that uh, it wasn't that you opened for Sinatra. Sinatra closed for you. <laughs> that's just like, that is so Frank, classic. You know, Frank would be with me. He would be with me when people would come up. Me and Frank would be at a cocktail party or something, and somebody would come up and, and uh, want to make small talk. They say, so, uh, you know, uh, how, how long have you been opening for Frank Sinatra? I said, Frank closes for me. And Frank would laugh. He'd say, yeah, I close the show for him. I, I'd okay. say, I, you know, I, I want to do a show in Vegas, and I needed someone to close for me. And so I asked Frank what he was doing and, you know, and, and, and show you a sense of humor. That's what a sense of humor is. That when is, you have, yeah. not have the ability to laugh at other shortcomings and misfortunes, right. when you have the ability to laugh at yourself. Absolutely. And Frank Frank would laugh at himself. He, he got it. Um, over the years, uh, I would imagine as well, you've worked with you know some of the other legends like yourself, the Phyllis Dillers, the Don Rickles, some of the others along the way. Oh, yeah. You know, I used to do the Dean Martin roast. And of That's course, right. you worked with all those great legends, you know. Yeah. And I was the one, the difference between the comedians of today and the comedians of my era, I knew every comedian that preceded me. I knew 
those stars, the Buddy Hackett's and the Milton Berle. Oh, yeah. The, the best. The, the Jan Murray's, the George Burns, the Jack yeah. Benny. Who was Alan my King. And, and I knew their careers and I knew all about them. Uh, young kids today, sometimes you'll see a comedian who's been doing it about six years and he not only doesn't know who you are, he thinks he invented stand-up comedy. Right. Or, or, right. or it all began with him or her, you know. Uh, not all, but but a lot of them think that they, they created the, what stand-up comedy is. And those artists of yesteryear were... Let me let me digress. A person is an artist in any endeavor. When they make their work, look one word, effortless. Mm, yes. Jack, yes. Jack many comedy look easy. You know, making it Frank Sinatra. You will be my music. You will be my song. You say, I can do that. No, you can't. He just made it look like you could. Exactly. You make, if you're a bartender, a truck driver, a bricklayer, if you make your work look effortless. You know, I once saw a guy in the backyard building a fireplace building a barbecue pit, a, a, a bricklayer. And I'm watching him and I thought, I could do that. It just was as smooth, but I couldn't do that. He just made it look like I could. Right, right, exactly. That's really what it is. I, I agree 110% because I get a lot of people that say, Jim, you always make it look so easy and smooth. And if something technically goes wrong, you can just fill right in. And, you know, you've been thrust into situations where you got to ad lib and keep it moving and keep it, you know, there's chaos and everything's on fire, maybe on the other side of the wall behind me, but get out there and just do something. And that is so huge to be able to do that. You're adrenaline, like for me, you know, I know what it is for you as well as a, you know, creative person, my adrenaline is like really flowing. It's like a sport, you know, I'm all in, all cylinders are firing, but the key is everybody else sees it as calm, cold, collected, floating in, floating out. But inside it's like, boom, 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 boom. you're aware of everything. You hear everything, you see everything as you're also doing your thing, right? Well, I teach young comedians that it's, first of all, remember this. It's a conversation, not a presentation. That's it's right. Your act, you're damn right it's your act. It's your job to make it look like it's not your act. That's like right. it's a conversation, not a presentation. I tell all young comedians, if, if I was telling you, I'd say, Jim, here's what you, if you're a new kid, I'd say, Jim, here's what you have to envision in your mind. Your wife says to you, Jimmy, oh, my God, we got 20 people in the living room, and I don't have dinner ready yet. Do me a favor. Go out there. And tell them some of your stories about growing up and, and about when you went to school and about your mom and dad. Tell some of those funny stories. So when you walk out into your living room, you're saying, hey, dinner's going to be ready in a few minutes. But I got to tell you what happened to me when I went to the store today. And when I was a kid, my older brother did. Now, that's I say to all young comedians. You walk out on stage every night that they're in our house. What intimidates most new performers is they're thinking, oh, I'm going to this strange place. And those people own it. And I'm imposing. Uh-uh. This is our house. If they could do what we do, they'd be up here. If they can't do what we do, that's why they're out there. So this is our house. And whenever you, when I walked out at Caesars Palace or any of the hotels, I always walked like, oh, look who's in my living room. Listen, I'm so glad you're here. And I know you came here to see Frank, but I got something to tell you before Frank comes. You know what I mean? It's a conversation, not a presentation. And don't get intimidated. It, it, the best way to intimidate yourself is to it, it conjure up in your mind that you're imposing upon them. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And, and that they're going to critique you and, and criticize a lot of people, actors, performers. Sometimes they get hung up on the fact that people are watching them. Even in, in, in television, one of the first things they always tell us uh, and told me years ago in school was when you look at the camera, just think of one person. Just think of the fact, think of your grandmother or somebody you love, somebody you care about. And uh you know, I did that at Carnegie Hall. I was uh, emceeing this this event at Carnegie Hall, which was this really cool, big holiday concert that composer Tim Janis puts on. And uh, I, our relationship developed through my work with public television. And he puts this really elaborate, beautiful holiday concert on in Carnegie Hall every year. He has me as MC, So I got the tux on. You'll probably appreciate this. I, I'm the master of ceremonies. It's New York, it's Carnegie Hall. 200 piece orchestra, 300 voice youth choir. Uh, Neil Sedaka was there, all these, Sarah McLaughlin, all these great performers in and out. So about 50%, this was all timing. This was really thinking, should I do it? Should I not? It's Carnegie Hall, but I went with it. I said to myself, gee, you know, I really wanna, there's a line that I wanna say, which is something that is so opposite of what you would think of with Carnegie Hall with this audience. It is holidays. It is New York. I am in the tux with the bow tie. I'm the MC. So, you know, with Carnegie Hall, 
when uh, they open up the big white doors, everything's strategic, it's formatted, nobody touch anything, open up the big white doors, the performer comes out, performer does their thing, and then they come, the doors open, and then the performer goes back behind those doors, then the doors open again, and then the MC comes back out and they do their thing. So a performer had come off stage, the doors opened up again, and I was saying to myself, I kept rehearsing whether I should do this or not. And I said, you know what, what the heck? It's, and, and you know this, you feel your audience based on where they are, the city, the location, the mindset, whatever it is. Um, and sometimes you tailor things to that audience that you know that they will respond to. So this was a situation where I said, this could be a risk because this is Carnegie Hall. It's a certain audience and what have you. But I said, you know what, then on the flip side, it's New York. Uh, it's a holiday concert, so they're already in this sort of happy mood. What the heck? I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. So the MC, moi, the doors open. Here comes the MC to the edge of the stage with the choir and the orchestra behind. You know, everybody, the, the musicians are like poised, just waiting. And the next artist is behind those white doors waiting for my intro. I come out. I pause, I look at everybody that's in front of me here, smiling in the tuxedo. They expect me to continue as the MC and introduce the next artist. Look up and acknowledge the balcony, which everybody sometimes forgets to do, the people up in the balcony. And I said to the audience here at Carnegie Hall, I said, aren't you glad you guys decided not to go bowling tonight? <laughs> At Carnegie Hall at a holiday concert, they're dressed to the nines. And what it did was it erupted in laughter and clapping. And then from that, that was about 50% in. I wouldn't do it in the beginning. I had to feel them out. 50% in, I said, aren't you? They totally didn't expect that. Uh, the crew in the back, when I went back, the doors opened after I did my piece, introduced the artist, the artist came out. And then went back there. The guys who are always very like, you know, stoic and we got our, you know, we have our task here at Carnegie Hall. They were high-fiving and everything else. Like, oh, my God, we never heard anybody ever say a line like that at Carnegie Hall. Aren't you glad to the audience you didn't go bowling tonight? <laughs> but but it's like you you feel the audience. You feel where you're at. And I said, it's New York. It's holidays. could go either direction, but it went in the right direction. I'm sure you've uh, taken many shots like that, right? Well, we, you know, I've been doing it 50 years, and but you know, what, a couple of things there. Number one is never be afraid to fail, especially if you're a stand-up comedian. Never be afraid to fail. If you're afraid to fail, get out of this business because you're going to fail many times. And sometimes it's when you're out there alive. And, and, and as the Italians always say, like in the movie A Bronx Tale, I took a shot. You know, when they asked the, the young kid, you know, his mother asked him that question, why are you? Why are you hanging around in the bar with all those hoodlums? And he said, I wasn't in that bar. And she said, don't lie to me. I saw you walking out of that bar. And Robert De Niro says, why did you lie to your mother? He said, I took a shot. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I always love that line because that's that's what we take a shot. Sometimes you're out there, you're on road and you, you go there. If you if you feel it, go it. Are you, you know, and it works and it doesn't it's sometimes. But you don't be afraid to fail. And right. the other thing is what you did there. Comedy is when you're writing a joke. Two things, remember. Number one, comedy is nine tenths surprise. The audience laughs because they didn't think you were going to say that or right. do that. So the setup line has to hide the punchline. And the other rule is usually there are no victimless jokes. Who's the victim of joke? Is it me? Is it you? Is it it's a society? You know, uh, years ago, I, I snuck backstage of a comedian named Mort Saul. I was brand new. I was only in the four months. And I snuck backstage to see if he would give me some advice. And he did. He spent two hours with me. It was wonderful. And one of the things he said to me, do you write your own material, Tommy? I said, yes. He said, remember, they're wrong. I said, who? He said, they. I said, who are you writing about? They're wrong. The government, they're wrong. The airlines, they're wrong. Your daughter's dating a punk rocker, he's wrong. Or you're wrong. Somebody's, you know. And so, uh, you know, anyhow, that, that's the essence of, of, of writing a joke, you know. That's really, you know, when you, when you think about it, that is what it is. And then I'm sure, you know, many times uh, you also have to come up with something on the fly. You're observing what's going on in front of you and something comedic comes into your head. Uh, I'm similar in that way, my father, I think I got a lot of that from my father. My father always able to come up with a quick quip based on some craziness that he's seeing in front of us, maybe in a supermarket line, at a department store, in traffic, whatever it is, something that is funny, but it's an observation of life in a quick, instantaneous way. 
And you're classic for doing that as well. I mean, you have the jokes, you have, you know what you're going to do, but there's sometimes something happens in the audience or something happens in that room where you just, it just comes automatically and you're able to respond to that in a humorous way, which really lightens the load for everybody else, right? Yeah. You know, you, 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 you learn through the years. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> opening for Frank Sinatra is, is unlike opening for anybody you've ever opened for yes. in your life. Now, yes. I was a seasoned comedian when I met him, but if I give, if I say to you, Jimmy, <clears throat> and, I, and I'll give you things what you were just talking about that relate what you were just talking about. There's 20,000 people in the arena, and we're say we're at the Nassau Coliseum in New York, and it's five minutes before showtime. And Jimmy, you're going to open for Frank Sinatra, and I say, Jimmy, here's what you got to do. You got to go out there. There's 20,000 people out there in the round. You got to go in the center of 20,000 people, Jimmy, and I want you to go out there for the next 45 minutes, and I want you to hold their attention. Oh, one more thing, Jimmy. I want you to hold their attention, but I want you to make them laugh for the next 45 minutes. Oh, one more thing, Jimmy. I want you to hold their attention and make them laugh, but I want you to make them laugh when you want them to laugh. I want you to pull the strings on the emotions of 20,000 people. No props, no tricks, no charts, no special arrangement, no orchestra, no special lighting, just you and 20,000 people. And one more thing, Jimmy, not one of them came to see you. So, now, what an assignment that is. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I would do, I would walk out there, and I know now there's 20,000 people in here, and sometimes there's two or 3,000 still trying to find their seats. Right. <laughs> they're, they're all over the place. I've got to get them to me now. Boom. i got to get them to me now. So I ain't, I'm not going to do A material right there. I'm not going right. to waste A material. On that. So i got to bring the focus to the stage of 20,000 people all around me. So I'd walk out, and I'd say, you know, the orchestra, they play me on. I walk out and I'd say, how many of you out there thought Frank Sinatra was coming out? Applaud those who thought Frank Sinatra was coming out. And they'd applaud. And I'd say, I know just how you feel. I'm a little bit disappointed myself, you know. Now, that would get a laugh. Then I'd say, yeah. how many of you out there are here in this arena for your very first time? Applaud. Applaud. I'd say, how many of you out there are seeing Frank Sinatra live your very first time? Applaud. And they'd applaud. I'd say, how many of you out there haven't, uh, how many of you out there aren't wearing any underwear or something like that? Yeah. They'd applaud. Now, all I was doing there was, I didn't say raise your hand. I said applaud. I talk, you react. I talk, you I'm teaching this audience, bringing them into my center. I talk, how many of you out there? Now I'm bringing them in, bring them in. When I, now all of a sudden, they, they, I'm in control here. I'm in command. The right. focus is on me. You know, right. 20,000 people. But I talk, you react. I didn't say raise your hand. I said applaud. And, and I can't tell you how that works. There's another trick that I used to pull sometimes if it was for some reason outdoors or a real rowdy thing. What I would do sometimes, I'd walk out and before I'd even start, I'd say, all those who can hear the sound of my voice, would you please look at those around you who are talking and say with me, shh. Now, I didn't say shush. I didn't say shut up. I didn't say be quiet. This is not, that, that's rude. This is, shh. That's not rude. Now, what I did, I just deputized a lot of people. And I'd say, once again, now those, a lot of people heard me. I'd say, once again, those who can hear the sound of my voice, look at those around you who are talking and say with me. Now, now the audience is with me. I got deputies out there. Now they all go with me. And boom, you got them. And then I then I go into you know, a role. But the other thing that you also did as a comedian, you tried to find out something that happened locally, that every it was in the news. Not just that a few people knew that it was in the news, whatever was in the news. And if I could open with those, you know, those, the, that, that material. I'll give you a quick example. One time I, we were flying, we landed in Louisville, and we'd land about an hour before the show, you know, the, the, when Frank's private jet. And I said to Frank, I'll ride up in front with the limo driver. No, no, he said, right back here. I said, no, I want to talk to the limo driver. He's from Louisville. I'd get in the front with a pencil and paper, pen and paper. I, and I, I, this particular time, I said, tell me everything that's going on in Louisville. To anything that's controversial. So anyhow, he would give me a bunch of stuff. One of the things I said to him, I said, who's the richest man here in Louisville? And he said, some guy named Bill Williamson or something like that. He said, he's so rich. Everybody knows how rich he is. I said, are there any scandals here? One of the scandals was there's a woman named Sissy Johnson or something like that who was running for public office and she claimed to have all these degrees, but she didn't. they found out she didn't have those degrees. And so it was a big scandal. On stage that night, after I got their attention, and got them focused on me. I said, you know, I love coming here to Louisville on a quiet night. If the wind is blowing just right, you can hear Bill Williamson counting his money. Now they all laugh because they all knew he had money. I said, or 
Sissy Spacek, or Spacek, not her name, Spacek, Sissy Johnson counting her degrees, you know, because she had just, now it got the biggest laugh the whole, that they thought, how could I know what was going on in their town? We just landed a few months ago. My reviews, and I, I did 30 minutes that night, my reviews in, in the paper that they sent me the next day was all about those first two jokes. Right, it right. took the time to localize, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just the way your mind operates and the ability to just do all of this is, is I think one of the reasons why you're so beloved, Tom, and why you've had this career that has spanned so many decades and people still love to see you and they want to hear your perspective and your understanding of the human condition. And all of that plays into what I think is also very cool, which some people watching you know, around the world with this global audience might not realize is you have this perspective and this understanding of the human human condition in such a way that you understand not only you know how to make people laugh and how them to how to get them to think about the idiosyncrasies of life that we all get hung up on but you understand the purpose of comedy the purpose of laughter the, re the release of those endorphins what it actually does for the mind body and spirit in ways that really transcends anything that we could even write down and you're so in tune with that even now like as a motivational speaker some of the, the commentary some of your videos some of the things you talk about are so cool because they really are explaining the importance and the purpose of laughing as much as possible and the comedic aspect of life on a daily basis right right well you know in acting classes they would have when i studied acting they would have you, uh, it seems we had to, to, to cry on command, yeah. you know, or to laugh on command, you know. And, and yet, so I, I tell people sometimes, I'm going to give you a prescription after I give a motivation speech. I want you to laugh 10 times a day. I said, watch this. <laughs> I, I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and I do that sometimes. I laugh at least 10 times a day. Now, and there's a reason. And I teach young comedians why you're so important in our society. Do you know how important you are if you're, if, to young comedians? Do not tarnish this business because you're such, so important. I tell them that, you know, that, that they did a survey around the world of uh, the 10 fears of man. You know, death was fourth. Pain was second. Getting in front of an audience was number one fear of mankind. If you can get up in front of an audience and you can talk, and you're a house painter and you can talk about that for 45 minutes or an hour, you know, you're in less than 1% of the population of the world. If you're a lawyer or a doctor, you can get up in front of an audience and you do that, you're in less than 1% of the population of the world. If you can get up and make people laugh for an hour, you're in less than one millionth of 1% of the population of the world. So what a gift you have. Don't tarnish that. I said, the reason why you're so um, laughter is psychologically a deterrent because the brain can't think of two thoughts at the same time. So if you're laughing, at, at a comedian or something, you're not thinking of your problems. So it's a psychological deterrent from your problems. We've always known that. But because of a man named Norman Cousins, Norman Cousins wrote a book called Saturday Review. I mean, he was an editor of a, of a, a magazine called Saturday Review. He ended up having a, a terminal illness, a heart condition, and he went in the hospital and the doctor told him it was because of a lot of years of stress and that he didn't have long to live. He laid in the hospital and he thought, if negative input stress made me ill, then positive input should make me well. So he checked out of the hospital and he'd only watch I Love Lucy reruns, Candid Camera, Three Stooges, Marx Brothers. He would only watch that stuff. He came, he got released from the hospital. He wouldn't watch the evening news. He wouldn't watch any of the news at all. He would listen to comedy albums. He lived 27 years after the doctors told him he was going to die. And because of him, UCLA did research on what happens to the human body when it laughs, when you have a hearty laugh. You know, when you, you laugh so hard sometimes, and tears are running down your eyes and you go, oh, and a sense of well-being comes over you. Mm. The body has actually released endorphins into the brain, into the bloodstream. So laughter is not only psychologically a deterrent, it's physiologically therapeutic. So comedians then are physicians of the soul. You know, you're making people laugh. You're making them healthier. People come to see you and they leave feeling better than they did when they, when they, when they walked in. You know, that's, I work, I try out new material at the Laugh Factory all the time because I want to stay in touch. And the audience are young black, young white, young Latino, young Asian, you know, all these different nationalities, couples. And I want to stay in touch with that young people. But, and again, they need laughter as well. Yeah, that's a picture of me on the Laugh Factory 
one night after I did a TV show. I did the David Letterman show in New York. That was the Laugh Factory in New York. And I had a suit and tie on because you don't usually don't wear a suit and tie at the Laugh Factory. But, but uh, <laughs> one night after I did Letterman in New York. But again, you know, how important is laughter, especially in these times? Yeah. But even if you don't have something funny, you can teach yourself to laugh. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you can teach the greatest gift that God can bestow upon a human being is a sense of humor. A yes. sense of humor, not when you have the ability to laugh at other shortcomings and misfortunes, when you have the ability to laugh at your own. So I was on Hollywood Squares one time, and and uh, uh, the, the question was, of 3,500 women polled, what's the number one characteristic they look for in a man? And the answer was a sense of humor. A man who didn't take himself too serious, who could laugh at himself. I, I tell guys that all the time, think about what I'm saying to you. You know, that, that you know, they want a, a man that can make him laugh. Now, you can teach your children a sense of humor. How you do that, your children look at you like you're a god. They can't picture life without you. you the, you're in, the, in their universe. You're the god of their universe. If you come home and say, what did I tell you the dumb thing I did today? Say you're a mom. I'm shopping. I reach up and I reach for a can of peas, and the can of peas fell out. I, my dress flew over my head. People were laughing at me. Now, <laughs> the kids love it that that happened to yeah. you. Every dumb thing that I ever did, I would share with my kids, and they would laugh. Now my kids laugh at themselves. They'll call me and tell me, guess what happened? You know? So it, 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 a sense of humor, again, by my humble definition, that's the greatest gift that, that a human being can have is learning to laugh at yourself and teaching your children to laugh at themselves too. Don't take yourself too serious. I think a psychiatrist would probably tell you the number one problem that people are in there, we take ourselves too serious. Yes. Laugh at Teach yourself how to laugh. Start out by first thing you get out of bed, look in the mirror. You won't ever see anything funnier than that when you first. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's exactly right. There, there was one bit you did when you were on Letterman. I mean, you were on Letterman multiple times. You even hosted, guest hosted for Letterman, um, where you had come out and you were talking about how, you know, in order to appear on the Letterman show on CBS, they uh, made you wear a name tag. Hello, I'm Tom Trees. <laughs> Tell us about that. That is just like so like. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hosting the David Letterman show and it's his show. And and and, and, I, and again, I walked out when they, here's your guest host, Tom Trees. And I said, um, you know, um, again, I said, how many of you were hoping Dave still might be coming out? You know? And I said, now the joke was on me. I said, I'll tell you where I'm at. I said, there's a saying, and I, I said, CBS wouldn't let me come out here without wearing a guest, you know, name tag to who you are. I said, I always feel like if you're over 40 years old and you're in a profession where they still make you wear a name tag, chances are you haven't made it. You know, and <laughs> so, so I put up myself. Yeah. And then, by the way, an old vaudevillian told me years ago, an old guy, I first was brand new. He was an old guy. He told me that he had worked in vaudeville. He said, remember, son, when you walk out there, the first joke is on you. And I tell public speakers, too, when you open, when you walk out and you're in the, at that podium and there's a, a, a hundred people or a thousand people out there, they're looking at you as a very successful human being and, you know, walk up there and tell them some dumb thing you did. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I used to tell, sometimes I'd go in front of an audience and I'd say, you know, and I think you've seen me do this, but I'd say, you know, what a great crowd. You know, I walk out and I'd say, there's a woman in the audience. I don't want to point her out, but I'm coming into the show and she come running up and she said, oh, you're my favorite entertainer. Could I get a picture with you? Get my husband to take a picture of you and I. And I say, sure. And she said, Harold, hurry, come quick. It's Regis Philbin. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're poking fun at yourself. That's a lesson for everybody, not, not necessarily entertainers, you know. And the, the other thing, I, I want can I share something with you that oh, I please do? Please do. I talk to people, motivation people out there. Stop making yourself a victim. You're not a victim, you're a victor. You know, I mean, I have a background that if I would have ended up in prison, ended up on the streets and in bed and, and doing terrible things, psychiatrists would probably say, you know, it wasn't his fault. You know, he was raised poor and both his parents were alcoholic and all these kind of things. You know, that's BS. It's BS. You know, don't let anybody ever talk to you in the victim. A while back, I'm giving a motivation speech at an all male college. <clears throat> and at that time, if you remember, there was a guy who his parents couldn't get him out of the house. He was 32 years old. And they had to go get a court order to get this guy out of the house. He's 32 years old. <laughs> he wouldn't leave the house. And I said to the kids, 
I said, of these young guys, I said, how old, how, how old do you think you should be before you leave your parents' home? How long do you think you should live with your parents, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, one kid raised his hand. And he said, well, we should say 50 or 60 years old. And I said, really? How many of you think the kids raised their hands? I said, now, why do you think that? He said, because we didn't ask to be here. And I said, oh, yeah, you didn't ask to be here. And I said, how many kids, a lot of kids raised their hand. We didn't ask to be here. I said, okay, I don't want to give you a biology lesson, but when the male and the female make love, from the male comes five million seeds. Did you know that? Two and a half million die instantly. The other millions die along the way. And soon there's only 100,000 seeds left and there's 50,000. Pretty soon there's only 10 seeds left. Five, four, three, two, one, you. You, you. Don't ever tell me you didn't ask to be here Bull, you fought to be here. You're a winner. Applaud yourselves. Five million to one, you're here. I'm in a room full of winners. Applaud yourselves. And they applaud themselves. You know, I say, you're not a victim. You're a victor. You were born a victor. You know. We are we are living in sort of that victim mentality. Uh, yes. Yeah, which which gets in the way, doesn't it? It sort of gets in the way. Like, for example, we had a great comment here that I, I want you to see where Karen Ayani in Pittsburgh says the young comedians that are being taught by Tom are being schooled by a comic comedic genius. This is an amazing show tonight, but it, it, it's about the sensibilities. It's about the understanding of the human condition uh, that you get and you've, you've done it all these years, but you still do it. Now your role is inspiring all these others that are up and coming. I mean, there's just certain, something special about, the time period, um, <laughs> everything that you've absorbed in your own life that made you who you are now, Tom, and to understand some of the craziness and the hangups and the ridiculousness of life. You, the Phyllis Dillers, the danger, Rodney Dangerfields, you know, Carson, these people quick, witty, funny, uh, maybe Lucille Ball, some of these others, Jackie Gleason, people who understood all levels, all genres, all backgrounds, all incomes, but really un stripped all that and just understood the basics of life and what we all need and want. And that's something you have absolutely mastered. And I think that's why, you know, your comedy and your level of comedy transcends the, you know, time. It doesn't matter what time period it is it's still relevant today because it's all about us and the craziness of life well you know when I, I i once wrote a poem that i won't do for you in fact it's the end of my book you it's know in the book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the end of my book but, um, yeah the, I, 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 anyhow it, it was called the sound of laughter yeah. you know as far back as i can remember or shortly thereafter I love to hear the sound of laughter. That's the beginning of the of the, uh, the of the book, uh, of, of, of ending of the poem called "The Sound of Laughter." And so, ever since I was a little boy, I loved to hear the sound of laughter. I would gravitate to it, you know, and and uh, and it made me want to make other people laugh, you know, because I love to hear that sound. And and uh, to this, day, even when I was in a service, you know, even though I wasn't a comedian, I just loved to walk into a room and, and brighten everybody up. You know, I, mm -hmm. I always, I know this sounds like humble pie, but I never really wanted to become rich and famous. I wanted to be able to influence people. And I found out I could influence people through laughter a lot. And then mm -hmm. later motivation, but if I could get them laughing and get them relaxing, and then, th th then I could maybe influence. And sometimes you'll tell a joke, you'll, you'll write a very clever joke that people as they're on their way home, they go, well, that was funny. And you know what? He's right about that. Yes. So, so you're, it's your teaching through laughter. And the other thing I, that I tell you. I have to tell you, I think that's why you're one of the coolest people on the earth, what you just said. Because you're, you're the fact that you, the, the riches and the fame which have followed were not the thrust of why you did and are doing what you're doing. You're doing it because it's out of your heart, out of your soul, out of your desire to understand people, to lift people's spirits, to make them feel good about themselves. You get blessing and joy out of that. That propels you forward to continue the comedy, to continue the motivation. And I'm very similar. I'm on the same page with my work in television and radio all these years. It's I'm in a similar mindset. If the riches and the fame and all that come 
nice, great, but it's not why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's one of the reasons why I think you are so revered. And I know you're going to hate all this, you know, but it's because of the fact that you're, you're still the guy from Harvey, Illinois, propelled into these other arenas with the, the glitz and the glam and all the stuff that comes, but you're still that solid guy that grew up you know, in South of Chicago and you've not lost that. And that's very important. That's why people continue to connect and identify with you. I, I appreciate that. And, and you hit on something that, 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 that strikes a nerve with me. No matter where I've gone in my life, flying in Frank Sinatra's jet, uh, staying at his compound six times a year, uh, performing at, at Ellis Island where my ancestors came, uh, receiving the Ellis Island Honor Award, all, all this being in rarefied air, no matter where I was, if I close my eyes, I see a little boy with a shoe shine box trudging through the snow, going from bar to bar, shining shoes to make money to feed his brothers and sisters. In my soul, that's who I am. I'm that little boy. And I envision the world from that viewpoint. You know, and, and I, 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 oftentimes you get these wonderful cliches that say he never forgot where he came from. They say that about me in Chicago a lot when they're introducing me. You know, he never forgot where he came from. Where I came from, it'd be pretty hard to forget that that childhood. But but again, it was the best thing that ever ever happened to me. The other thing is that that you know when I read all these positive mental attitude books when I was in the service that I mentioned earlier, all the books. There was a lot of times I would read things about the yin and the yang, and I couldn't understand yin and yang. And then I began to read more, and I began to realize that we are two energies: we're ego and we're spirit. Now. We're, we're not born ego. We're born pure spirit. We don't know if we're boy or girl, black or white, Jew or Gentile. We're just the spirit. And we gravitate to everything that loves us. And we love them. We're spirit gravitating. Well-intentioned adults sometimes misinformed start programming our computer. Little boys do this. Little girls do that. You know, we Italians do this. We, we Catholics do that. Whatever. You, you, they're starting to program your computer. And thus the ego is formed. At a certain time, about four or five years old, you start to develop an image of yourself based upon their information. And the ego is formed. So, and the ego, and you, you have two energies now, your ego and your spirit. The ego has an insatiable appetite. The ego can never get enough fame, fortune, money, power. It simply can't get enough. It, it will drive you to destruction because it can't get enough fame, fortune, money, power. It just keeps going on and on. That's it. The spirit, conversely, is like that song of the 70s by the Hollies. All I need is the air that I breathe and to love you. That's all your spirit needs. All I need is the air that I breathe and to love you. So you're one of those. Your energy is coming from one of those two. And, and that's battle all of our life, our yin and our yang. You're driving down the street. A guy pulls in front of you in his car, and he, you slam on the brakes, and you start cursing. You dumbs him. Now, that's your ego. This is my car, my space, and you're in my way. That's your ego. Your spirit says, Gosh, am I glad no one got hurt. Have a good day. Boy, am I glad you're okay. Yes, not, not, sorry. You know, we, that's your spirit. So we, if you can, try to bring your spirit to the forefront as much as possible. And, and I'm like anybody else. My ego jumps in there sometimes, and I have to recognize it and then throw it out of there. You know, Let your spirit be your guide is the oldest cliche of all. Is that something that all of this extraordinary stuff that you're sharing with us that is like going from my head to my toe right now, and I know the audience, um, is this stuff that you always knew or did it come from the experiences of life? You know, the, the trudging forward, the, the working your butt off, the blood, sweat and tears, the toil. Was it the experiences of life that as you went along in your phenomenal world of comedy, as a comic genius and legend that you are, Tom, which you won't say, but the rest of us will on your behalf. Uh, was it through all of these experiences you understood, hey, you know what, darn it, this is what it's all about? Or were you always sort of that young kid that was sort of an old school, old soul person, kind of like I am, which you pointed out before we even went live on the air, we had a great conversation about that. Um, who understood some of these things even before, you know, the limelight came your way and the celebrity and, and being famous and all that came your way. Did you already have these sensibilities early on in your life? You know, it's funny that you say that because oftentimes 
when I would be reading a book about improving your life, one of these positive mental attitudes books, there'd be a paragraph or something, and I'd say, I know that. Yeah. I know that, even though I never practiced that. Right. But I know that. And then there would be other times. And, and, and so as years went by, you know, you'd say, you know, somehow I knew that. So I think that was because it got in touch with my spirit. That line hit me and got in touch with my spirit. I know that. You know, and I, I so, so many times in my life, giving motivation talks or something or helping one person one on one, a friend would call and want some advice. And they'd say, later, you don't know how much you changed my life. You know, one line that you used that, that it changed my life. And I would say to them from The Wizard of Oz and that song, Oz never did give nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have. You know, we all have that. It's there if you look for it. The inner journey is far more exciting than the outer journey. Yes, yes, you know? yes. What are some of the things you discovered about yourself through all of that? That I'm, I'm that I'm um, like I'm a sinner, <laughs> and that that I've made so many mistakes. But I'm what was in the past was in the past. That I had to learn to forgive myself, which I couldn't. A lot of the mistakes I made, and they're in the book, and and and, and yeah, still yeah. stand. Yeah. Uh, I, and, but I, I learned that I'm human. I learned that, that I'm frail like anybody else. But I also learned that I'm stronger than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. and I'm a lot stronger than I thought I was. Yeah. And, and, and that I, you know, I, uh, again, going back to my foundation, some people don't believe in a higher power. I do. I mean, my, my father yes. in heaven, I can't tell you how many times life brought me to my knees many times. I mean, you read the book. When I say I got knocked down, I got knocked down physically. And it's yes. in the book. I got yes. knocked down literally too, you know, uh, but, but I, I found that, that uh, I'm a man of faith and that, um, and that I have the faith that I read one time when I was a little boy, I read that you have to have the faith of a child, you know, to, to that, that's the kind of faith you have to have. The, yes. the smarter we get, the more we, we, you know, the, the geniuses will tell you, you know, science will tell you that, you know, that there is no greater power, no higher power, but, but there is, I, I'll tell you a quick story. The first night I ever appeared on stage with Tim Reed, something I had written got a laugh. Now, I'd been wandering aimlessly, going from job to job to job. I didn't know what I wanted to do. That first night on stage, I, something I had written got a laugh, and it was like an epiphany, like one of those old B movies where the dark clouds open up and the sun bursts through. And yeah. my, whole, my whole being went, yeah, oh, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, I now, oh, yes. God, I found it. I know, what you, I know what you want of me. Now, that night, it was a Friday night. I couldn't sleep all night, I, 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 and I woke up Saturday. I couldn't sleep all night. Saturday morning, I got up and I went straight to the church where I, when I was a little boy, I was an altar boy there, and I sang in the choir, and my mother sang in the choir when she was a little girl in the same church, neighborhood church. There was no service there. I was the only one in church. I got on my hands and knees. I said, okay. God, I know what I want. I know what I want now. I, I, I want to be a comedian. If you could, and I'm praying, if you let me make my living as a comedian, the thought that you could make a living making people laugh overwhelmed me. I said, wow, the you, that you might make a living making people laugh. I said, oh, please, God, if you let me make my living, I'll, I promise I'll do charities. I'll give back. Oh, Lord, I I'm making all these promises, right? That prayer that I prayed has come true. All my dreams have come true I, from that. That was 50 years ago in September. I went back there in September. That was September of 1969. I went back to that church in September of 2019, 50 years later, and I gave a sermon on the power of prayer. And I told that audience right over there where I prayed, right in the print. I said, now, I said to the audience, how many of you out there have been thinking about somebody and you haven't seen him in years and the phone rings and it's that person. And you go, I was just thinking about you. Or you walked around the corner, you're talking about somebody and there you were thinking about how many of you and everybody raised their hand. I said, then if human beings can transfer thought and we can, you just said it to me then how powerful could a supreme being that you could transfer thought to? So that's the power of prayer, you know? Yes, yes. You know what? Uh, what I'm hearing from you, and I'm loving this conversation, and we're getting a lot of comments from people around the world that are really being moved by this. Um, and you, you know, when you watch your comedy, it could go back to day one for you till today. There's essences of what you're saying right here and right now on this show that are sprinkled into all aspects of your comedy. 
that, that understanding of people and the human condition and what really matters in life and really what it's all about. And that's an extraordinary understanding. What I say in, in relation to that, because I've had a couple of people that I've interviewed, you know, professionally in my work in television say to about me, I'm seeing in you. And that is um, a high level empath. You're very empathetic to people and understand their plights and their trauma and their, their needs. And you're an intuitive. You understand intuitively some of these things about life. So that way, when somebody says, my God, you know, what you just did is something I just thought about before. And how did you already know that? And um, you, you also operate, I think, from a higher consciousness. You hear everything. You feel everything. You understand everything that's going on. You soak it all in. And for you, your transfer from all of that, from a higher power, whatever it is, you're sort of like a facilitator, like a conduit. All of this energy is coming through Tom Driesen and coming out for the benefit of all of us as comedy, right? Yeah, well, again, you know, if, you, if, if, if somebody comes to a motivation class, you know, they came because they want to be motivated. Or if you're going to an algebra class, you know, when people come to the comedy club or they want to laugh, they came to laugh. They didn't come to be lectured or preached to, you know, but if you can, if you can lighten up their load by giving a little bit of philosophy with humor, you know, if, 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 again, like I say, um, that, that uh, if you're on your way home and you say, boy, he was so funny or she was so funny tonight. And you know what? That gave me an idea how I might change my life. You know, uh, you know, uh, then, then, then you do Then you're doing two services. One is you made them laugh and that's making them healthy for laughing. And the other is you gave them some, a little bit of advice, you know, uh, and you can do that through comedy very easily, you know, uh, and, and I've done it many times, you know, uh, and sometimes, you know, that something through motivation will end up in the motivation class. will end up saying, I'm going to put that in my nightclub act or my nightclub act. I said, I'm going to put that in my, my motivation. You know, uh, it's, it's just, it's, you know, a, a, a while back, this isn't funny, but a while back I had a friend come over and he was very, very depressed. He had suffered a mild heart attack and he was 51 years old. Mm -hmm. And after people have heart attacks, sometimes they go through a little period of depression. Then he said, Tommy, uh, I'm going to feel depressed and everything. Can you help me? I said, look, I'm not a doctor. Um, you, you might want to go get a physical checkup. You might have a chemical imbalance or something like that. Right. Said, he, he said, but you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm fearing dying. He said, and that's, that's one of my fears. I said, well, that's a common fear of all mankind. But let me tell you this. I said, put it this way here. The day that I started to live, that I truly started to live, was the day that I totally embraced the fact that one day I was going to die. And I, I said, no, it's morbid. I, I said, everybody said, oh, I know that line, but we don't embrace it. But we know it. We put it in the back burner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I said, because the day that you start to live is the day you totally embrace the fact that one day you're going to die because then you have a choice. You can live every day until you die, or you can die every day until you die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And you live every day negative and complaining and woe is me and blah, blah, boom, blah, da, da, da. And I, and this is, and why can't I have fun? And why, you know, and putting all that, and then one day it, it, you're going to die. You know, because you die every day until you live every day. Because the clock stops for nobody. The clock continues ticking, whether you, you know, exactly like what you're saying, the clock continues going forward. It doesn't go backward. It goes forward, no matter whether you're absorbing it and living the, to its fullest and, and shining the light on others, or you're, you're home worried about the fact that the clock one day for you is going to stop. We have a certain amount of time and it's about really maximizing it, right? Yeah, but, but again, you just, what, what is the lesson there? The lesson is live every day, live every day, every day. This is, you know, I get out of bed in the morning and I say, and, and it's, it's, it's a biblical thing, but this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What wonderful thing am I going to do today? Wh whose life might I change? Who might change mine? You know, a while back, I was on an airplane many years ago and I, and I, I was on my way to do a show. This is when I first got hot and I, I, I was doing the Tonight Shows and all these other shows. And when you had been a comedian as long as me and you weren't, hadn't got a lot of work, when you start getting work, you don't turn down anything. You take every job. One day I was on an airplane heading east and I looked out the window and I saw myself on a plane going west. You know, that's <laughs> when I knew I been I was working too hard. But I was on this plane one time about a six hour flight and uh, and I had, had uh, 
read everything but the air sickness bag. And now I picked up a magazine about anthropology, and and uh, and it was uh, uh, Dr. Carl Sagan, who used to wait, be on the Tonight wait. Show. Wait, there's no way we can let that slide. We just said you read everything except the air sickness bag. <laughs> I, yeah, I read everything but the air sickness bag. But, but now now I, I pick up this old magazine. <laughs> and, uh, Even just that is like. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, There's the something about that. That's a quick. That's just automatic. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, uh, so I'm reading this, and it's about that saying dinosaurs ruled the planet Earth for 250 million years. Man in the form from Cro-Magnon to Neanderthal, and now about a thousand years or something like that. Man has been on the planet. But dinosaurs ruled the planet for 250 million years, and it said that this planet has been here five billion years, and it's going to be here five billion more years before the sun destroys the earth, that the earth is actually moving closer to the sun. And one day, the earth will not look unlike Mars looks like right now. That, that it, That's five billion years now. And I put the magazine down, and I said, this planet was here five billion years before I was born. Not thousands, mm -hmm. five billion. And it's going to be here five billion years after I die. That means my lifetime is a blink of an eye, a speck of sand, pop, pop, it's over. That you would spend one moment of that blink of an eye bitching and moaning and cursing your lot in life is an absurdity. That you would spend one moment of that blink of an eye, you know, uh, going to a job you hate every day, uh, uh, you, you, know, uh, you know, not searching for other people to help or whatever. Right. You're spitting in your master's face saying, I don't appreciate this great gift of life. You know, every day is, is a celebration. What wonderful thing am I going to do today? If someone knocked on your door every day and gave you a beautiful, unique, original gift every day, how much would you appreciate the gift? How much would you appreciate the giver of the gift? Every day is a brand new day. Whatever happened yesterday, it's like a blackboard. Erase it. It's gone. It's a new day. Let's put something new on the blackboard. Every day is a new day, you know. Uh, and, and it's all a state of mind. There's, there's a, a great book uh, by Shed Helmstetter called... Um, uh, what to say when you talk to yourself. The most important person you'll ever talk to is yourself. You know, you know, talk to yourself. You, you know, when, when you, you say things to yourself, say positive things to yourself. And you so know? many people are uncomfortable with that. They're very good at attending to the needs of everything and everyone else and trying to guide and, and, and control and console everybody else. But when they look in the mirror, they don't like it. They have tough times seeing self. Well, you know, again, self-worth is, is, is really the important thing. If you're lucky and you find the work that you love, that's great. If you haven't found the work that you love, go try to help other people. Sometimes we find what, we're, what, what our life's journey is by helping others. And Simon Emerson said, you live a good life if you leave this world better than you found it. You know, and, and, and that might be just by helping a neighbor or helping somebody else. But again... Oh, there's so many, you know, we're, we're getting way off the subject of comedy here, you know, and, and more on, on the philosophy. But I'll, I'll leave with this. The, 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 the mind, <clears throat> you know, is if you think negative thoughts, and we all do, negative thoughts are swirling around the universe. You know, the mind is like a garden. If you're going to plant flowers in a garden, which are positive thoughts, say, you know, you're going to plant flowers and weeds grow. Would you allow the weeds grow? You would keep digging the weeds up. You know, cause, and you wouldn't let the weeds grow and you replant flowers. So when negative, when negative thoughts come into your mind, you can cast them out. You don't have, to, they'll come into your mind. We can't stop them from coming to mind. You go, whoa, whoa, stop. And just like your computer go, cancel, cancel, delete, delete, and replace it with a positive. That's right. You know, and, and what, that, what that is saying, I'm in control. This is the vehicle we've been given. This vehicle. And you're in control of this vehicle. The pilot who lands at 747 every day, does he rush down to the airport going 100 miles an hour, go out to the tarmac, slam on the board the aircraft, and take off down the runway and say, now, where am I going? No, he files a flight plan. Mm -hmm. And you have to file a flight plan. That's it's right. a subconscious. That's right. Front. And so, again, positive thoughts. It's all about, if I said to anybody, and then, we'll, again, we'll close it. I don't mean to keep holding people on with this because I know they're, no, no, no. they're loving it. They're loving it. Yeah. <laughs> If, if, if you go, if I say to anybody in the world, I want you to get physically fit, they go, I know how to do that. One word, exercise. Mm -hmm. I say, I want you to get mentally fit. Most people go, duh. One word, exercise. Yeah. yeah. Exercise the mind, the way you exercise the body. Listen to this. Day by day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Day by day in every way, I'm better and better. That's mm -hmm. an exercise. 
That's right. Kind of song, say, I feel happy. I feel healthy. I feel terrific. I feel happy. I feel healthy. I feel terrific. Every time that, that it, some negative thing would come to his mind, he'd throw it out and say, no, I feel happy. I feel healthy. I feel terrific. I, I went to a serious, it's in the book, a serious surgery over a year ago, a very serious. And or, or, I mean, I'm now I, I shouldn't give away the stuff in the book. But anyhow, but in the recovering, I kept saying, Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. When I'm telling you when I could hardly move, day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. We, you know, you're, you're in charge of it. You know, like as there is, I say, I'm a God of the universe. This is your universe. This is what you've been given, this body, this mind. This, you're in charge of this universe. Don't let other negative things take charge of your universe. You're in charge. You're flying this plane. And you can let whoever on that plane you want, or you can throw whoever off that plane you want, you know. Yes, Linda, you're absolutely right. I do. Thank you. You're absolutely amazing. I mean, uh, I, I think people are seeing a side of you that maybe they haven't seen because of the extraordinary body of work in, in your career. I, I, I do want to switch back to the comedy side of things. I want to know about how that meeting of you and Sinatra came to be how, how did this happen where he it's almost as if he took you under his wing and he saw something in you and he said hey kiddo you know ride with me and we'll go places how did all of this happen by the way that's milton burl and me and frank yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> one night i was preparing with frank at the golden nugget that's in atlantic city and frank said to me hey tom this he came my dressing room. i got a new comedian wants to meet you and he wants wants you to give him some advice and i said really and around the corner comes milton burl <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. It was a comedian like 30 years before I was born, I think. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, it was a fun, it was a fun thing. But so how I, I met, yeah. How did you I get met? connected with Sinatra? Yeah. From being glib at the right time. I'm, I'm, I've tried to with Sammy Davis for years. I'm now touring with Smokey Robinson, mm -hmm. who's a friend of mine. Smokey's a dear, dear friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, Smokey and I were working together. And Frank was appearing next door at Harris Hotel in, in Lake Tahoe. And, and those who know Lake Tower, they know that Caesars, and then there's a, 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 like a, a casino in the middle, and then next to it, and then there's Harris. I came off stage one night. Talk about divine intervention. Yeah. I could have gone to see Frank's nights where there, something made me want to go see him on a specific night. That night, I didn't change out of my stage clothes. When I finished my show, I just ran off stage straight over to Harris Hotel, and I'm running into the showroom. Because I wanted to see Frank's entrance, I seen Frank. I had seen Frank Sinatra perform before. He created more excitement walking to the microphone than most comedians um, and most entertainers um, create with their whole act. Just him walking out to the microphone, people would just go whoa, and they'd just cheer and electrify. And he hadn't sung a note yet, and I didn't want to miss that grand opening, that opening of him. So I'm running into the showroom when the vice president of Harris Hotel, a man named Holmes Hendrickson, saw me. And he was talking to a big heavy set guy with a cigar. And he said, he said, Tommy, come here, come here. And I, I reluctantly went over there because I didn't want to miss Frank's opening. So I walk over and he said, Tommy, this is Mickey Rudin. Well, I recognize the name. That was Frank Sinatra, Mickey Rudin, R-U-D-I-N. You know? And he said, Mickey, this is Tom Dreesen. And I think Tom would make a very good opening act for Frank Sinatra. And the lawyer got a pained expression on his face like he had heard that a million times. And he winked at the vice president, but I caught the wink. He said, hey, kid, if I gave you a week with Frank, would you want more than 50000 I said, Mr. Rudin, put it this way. If you gave me a week with Frank, would you want more than 50000 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he couldn't. He started laughing. He said, I like this, kid. And a week later, they said to me, would you, um, would you uh, uh, want to work one week with Frank Sinatra at the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City? And I said, I figure I'll get my picture taken with him, hanging every bar back in Harvey. And uh and that would be it. Well, the second night I did the show with him, his wife, Barbara, and he took me out to dinner. And I can remember like it was yesterday in the middle of the meal, he set his knife and his fork down and he looked at me. I was sitting across from him. He said, I like your material, I like your style. Do a few other dates with me if you're interested. And I didn't let me check my calendar. I said, yeah. And, and it turned into 14 years, 45, 50 cities a year, a friendship that, that I'll always treasure. I spoke at his funeral. I was a Paul Bear at his funeral, and and I miss him every single day of my life. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say? I, I love this. Tell us about this photo here, cutting of the cake. 
that was our 10th anniversary of together. We were together we were like 14 years and our 10th anniversary together. He, he had a cake and, to, and, and he gave me a watch, a beautiful watch that I have in the other room um, that he engraved, you know, uh, but that, that was our 10th anniversary at the Civic Opera House in Chicago. And then afterward, afterward, we went to a little Italian restaurant and we had dinner and, and uh, he said some real kind things about me that night, you know. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's really amazing. It's he, he like really, he, you know, at a young age for you, he took you under his wing. There's so many other people. He did something he spotted in you, Tom, that he identified with that uh, was magic, wasn't it? Well, I think, you know, we had, as the more we talk, he was a kid from the, from Hoboken and I'm a kid from Harvey, you know, and he grew up around saloons. His mom and dad had a bar called Marty O'Brien's Bar and Grill. And he would sing in the saloon. They had those old Nickelodeon pianos, he told me, where you put like a nickel in and, and it would roll a song. And the sailors would give him a nickel if he would sing sing alongside, you know. So Frank grew up in saloons. And of course, I shine shoes in all these saloons, you know. Uh, I had three children, girl, boy, girl. Frank had three children, girl, boy, girl. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we just found that we, the more I talked to him, that we had things in common. However, he was this extraordinary talent. You know, the one thing that, uh, that Frank Sinatra never knew how much in awe of him I was, because it's something I picked up on when I first met him. might have been that I was my bartender years, but he had millions of fans. He didn't want another fan. He wanted a pal, a guy to hang out with, you know, and I picked up on that. And I, you know how many times I wanted to be like any other fan? I wanted to say, you know, when you did that movie uh, uh, From Here to Eternity, you know, you did this or tonight when you were on stage. I was like any other fan. I wanted to tell him, you know, but I knew that he, he first of all, he, he had a tough time taking a compliment. He had fluffed it off. You know, uh, I'm the same way, by the way. I, I, it's, you know, but. Uh, me too, me too. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you, but anyhow, he. So I, we found the longer we stayed together, that we 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 had we enjoyed each other's company, and I made him laugh. And by the way, he he could be dark. He had some dark moods. Sure. And answer to that that one woman who just put the question: or yes, he was like a father like figure. Father figure, yeah. Father part of my life. Earlier, when I met him, he was a he was the boss. Like I said earlier, later he became uh, like a buddy, a pal. But at the end of his life, he was like a father figure. Mm. The kind of father I, I would have liked to have had because he. he it gave me a lot of advice, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? You know, the, the, there's sorry, a lot. Of, there's a lot of misconceptions, of course, about Sinatra. But I know, in conversations, you've been very, very adamant about um, sharing the philanthropic part, the the loving part, all these wonderful things that a lot of people don't think about, dwell on. That he was really, really not necessarily known for behind the scenes in helping people and help lifting people and making sure people that are in need got what they needed, right? Well, you know, the reason why you never heard, Frank Sinatra didn't want people to know. He did so many things that you'll never know. He didn't want people to know. And there's a reason for that. <clears throat> for all of you who are, think about this, the, the, there's a, everybody wants to be successful, okay? There, there was a, um, a, a book many years ago that was written called Dr. Hudson's Secret Journal. Uh, it, it later was a, a, another book he wrote was called The Magnificent Obsession by Lloyd C. Douglas. And its predecessor was Dr. Hudson's Secret Journal. In it, and they made a movie of The Magnificent Obsession. Was, and I know Frank and I read that book. In it was the secret of success. If you want to be successful in any endeavor, there's a secret and it's biblical in nature that you must you know, you might, when, once you say, I would love to, Lord, help me be a comedian, or I want to be a, 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 an engineer, or I'd like to own my own restaurant, whatever it is you're praying for, believe, ask, and you shall receive. If you believe that, ask, and you shall receive. You know, that once you, once you ask it, you have to believe it's going to happen with all your heart, body, and soul. But then your master's going to reward you. But for the, you have to keep your eyes and ears open for his less fortunate children. And you must help them and do it privately and quietly. You don't, you don't do it for applause or for any, you do it privately and quietly that the other person doesn't know that you did that. You do something that you know there's a need and you do it for them and they don't know that. And if you do that within 30 days, your master will reward you towards your endeavor. Now, if the other person has to know, you have to swear them to secrecy. And then you have to tell them that uh, you must never tell anybody only, and you can't pay me back. You must pay it forward. Now, that was written way before the movie came out, but it was written in another movie, Lloyd C. Douglas. Now, I believe Frank Sinatra more than anybody knew that. 
if Frank Sinatra picked up a newspaper in the morning, he read that some girl had a brain tumor and, and needed a surgery done in, in, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, then the next day somebody would deliver a check to that family, that poor family, and that, that was all paid for. And the guy delivering the check did not know where it came from either. So he knew, he, he, you never knew all the things that this, this man did. I once introduced him actually at his last performance. The very last performing, um, he, he, the last song he ever sang is The Best Is Yet To Come. He did six songs that night. He was supposed to do three for a charity, him and I. <clears throat> he ended up doing six, he never sang again. And for those who are tribute buffs, the last song he ever sang is The Best Is Yet To Come. It's on his tombstone. It says The Best Is Yet To Come, Francis Albert Sinatra. But that night, I told the audience about how much he has done in his lifetime for charities. You'll never know how much he's done. I said, my mother had a plaque in her kitchen, an old plaque. It said, the talent you have is God's gift to you. What you do with that talent is your gift to God. Frank Sinatra sang his songs and millions and millions of dollars were raised and Protestant orphanages were built. Mm. He sang his song and millions of dollars were raised and Jewish temples were built. He isn't Protestant and he isn't Jewish. He sang his songs and millions of dollars were raised and thousands of African-American children went to college and he is an African-American. If the talent, if it's true that the talent you have is God's gift to you, but what you do with that talent is your gift to God, I know of no one in my industry that is for their God than Frank Sinatra. Exactly. He did it quietly. And quietly. You also had this wonderful relationship with the one and only Johnny Carson. You mentioned a, a little bit about that. That's one of the greatest things that could have happened to anybody, especially a comedian, was to have Carson call you over and have you sit down. That very first appearance, and I was watching it again today on uh, the internet, when you were out there, and you nailed it. I mean, you nailed that very first appearance. The audience was, uh, you know, they were choking with laughter. Carson, you can hear him laughing in the background. And then you're brought over to that chair, that chair right next to his desk with his cigarette lighter, his cigarette box, his microphone, his coffee cup, and his smile. What was that like when Carson called you over and there you are with Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show? Well, again, for those who didn't hear the earlier part, <clears throat> they just tuned in. In 1975, wherever you went in America, when people say, what do you do for a living? You say, I'm a stand-up comedian. The next question was, oh, yeah, have you ever been on Johnny Carson? So if you appeared on the Johnny Carson show, then to America, you had arrived as a comedian. But to my industry, you had not arrived unless you sat down and talked to Johnny. To America, you had arrived, but not to the industry. So Johnny didn't call you over always on your first appearance. He wanted to make sure that you had another shot, maybe another shot, that you were going to you know, grow as a stand-up comedian. So the third time I did his show, that time he called me over. And once, and that's the picture you just showed, that when, he, when I sat down and talked to him, then, then to my industry, I had arrived. And, uh, and, and, and that, that, you know, that now you're someone that you, know, that you could tell funny stories. See, Johnny did not want you to, he wanted, he, people were all day long working hard jobs in the politics of the world and everything. When they tune, when he came home at night to have dinner and, 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 and they're talking about all the problems at dinner and then maybe you're going to your second job and there's more problems than the kids. Finally, everybody's in bed and you go and you turn on Johnny and you're going to get some laughs before you go to sleep. So come to that show prepared with strong, if you're a singer, strong songs. If you're a comedian, a strong model. And when you sit down, tell some funny stories. That's what Johnny wanted to hear, you know. And I used to love to tell him funny stories, you know, and, and make him laugh, you know. Also had a, you also had this amazing relationship with Letterman. How did that develop? Because you could see when, when you look back, and as again, this clips on YouTube and elsewhere where you see your appearances on Letterman, you can see in Letterman's face his excitement for having you as his guest. He was so like in the zone with you. Tell us about that relationship you forged with David Letterman. Uh, I, I met David when he, the first time he, drove out to Los Angeles to become a stand-up comedian. He actually came out to be more of a writer and he was going to do some stand-up comedy. He walked, he went to the comedy store and I had just came off stage and I walked off stage and he said to me, gee, I enjoyed your material, Mr. Dreesen, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. Older. So I said, I said, oh, hey, what is your name? And, and I'm, I'm so extroverted, you know, what, what is your name? And uh, 
He said, Dave, I said, oh, Dave, where are you from? He said, I'm from Indianapolis. And so I start talking sports. Gee, there's no major league baseball team there. Who did you root for? And I'm so extroverted, I kept taking to him. Had I known he was a shy guy, I would have respected that and, and left him alone. But I, I was so extroverted. The next day I saw him, hey, Dave, how you doing? And I took it to him again that by the time, by the time we became real good friends and I realized that he was a recluse kind of guy, it was too late to be friends. And we've been friends ever since. But I got to tell you a typical David Letterman story. He calls me about two months ago. He said, hey, Tom, every time I do an interview or you do an interview and people say, how did you meet? We tell that same story that you came off stage. I complimented you and we've been friends ever since. I said, yeah. He said, well, it's boring. It's a boring story. I said, well, but it happened. He said, I don't care. It's boring. He said, from now on, you tell people that you came off stage and I was in the parking lot and I had stolen some material from you and you beat the hell out of me in the parking lot. I said, now, why would I tell people that? He said, because it's a funnier story. It's a better story. Tell people that I stole material and you beat the hell out of me. I said, I'm not going to tell that story because, you know, you, you, you've been on TV for 32 years. You'll have your fans chasing me down the street. He said, it's a, I'm going to tell everybody that it's a funny story. Now, a month goes by. He calls me and he said, do you know the governor of Illinois? I said, yeah, I met him, but I don't know him. He said, well, he, David had a problem. He wanted to help people. And it was a real nice thing that he was going to do, but he needed to talk to, the, to somebody. I said, well, I know the uh, majority leader, a man named John Cullerton. And, and I said, uh, I'll talk to him. I called John Cullerton. John said, oh, Tom, I know about that situation. And tell David, we're going to do that. I said, would you do me a favor? Would you tell David? Because it was about a statute and, and stuff that I, I couldn't, uh, some kind of law. And so I said, would you tell Dave if I give Dave your number? He said, oh, sure. You want to talk to David Letterman. He was excited. And I said, oh, will you do me a favor, John? Tell him the only reason you're helping him is because you heard that Dreesen beat the hell out of you in a parking lot at the comedy store. He said, okay. He said, okay. Now, he talks to Dave. Ten minutes later, my phone rings. I go, hello. Dave said, didn't I tell you it's a better story? I told you that's a better story. <laughs> <laughs> that's so classic. That's fantastic. I also want to talk about, again, I mentioned a little bit about this extraordinary honor that you received. Tell us about that. The Ellis Island, uh, beautiful honor that you got there. Well, that was for all the, you know, I, my, my sister had multiple sclerosis. And, and so every year I would run 26 miles for multiple sclerosis. People would pledge money for every mile I ran. And uh, I would bring celebrities in from all around, all over Hollywood, you know, that would run part of their way with me a mile, two miles, um, you know, whatever. Uh, I had Frankie Avalon, Tony Danza, Frankie Valley, uh, Smokey mm -hmm. Robinson. Um, uh, you know, Eddie Marinero, um, uh, geez, I, 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 so many stars and, and, and Chicago Bears, Jim McMahon and, and Tom Thayer and, and Tim Reitman, all these uh, stars and baseball, Rick Sutcliffe and Mark Reese, Grace from the Cubs. Those, they all helped me. They'd come every year. Smokey's the only one who ran all 26 miles with me. But that was one. Of, and, and so um, I, I, I did a lot of charities in my life. And but there was one special thing about Ellis Island. Normally, you know, that's a nice award. The Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award was, was very nice for humanitarian service to your country. But when I told you that there was a man named Frank Polisi, uh, my mother's brother-in-law, my, my, my mother's sister's husband that owned the tavern that I used to emulate when I was a kid, uh, he told jokes behind the bar and I, went, I, I would always emulate him. Well, as time went by, I mean, I really loved him, and, and he liked me a lot. He'd hug me and all that stuff. And um, as I got older, I, I noticed that I looked like everywhere I went, people would say to me, hey, Polizzi, how you doing? I'd say, my name isn't Polizzi. I was a little boy. I said, my name is, oh, okay, okay. I said, he's my uncle. They'd say, oh, and I think they thought he was my mom's uh, brother, you know. So I said, okay. Now, as I got older, I looked so much like his sons, but I didn't look like my brothers and sisters. My older brother had hair and blue eyes. And anyhow, when I was about 13 years old, I started realizing where babies came from. I didn't want to believe my mom and dad did this, let alone my mom and my, my uncle. But I said, thinking those thoughts and, and feeling anguish for thinking those kind of But when at the time I was almost 15, I went to his house. He's a tough guy, by the way. He took no stuff from nobody, nowhere. Tough, tough guy. You know, I've seen him throw teamsters out of his bar two at a time. He, he, he was my size, but he, he could handle himself. Anyhow, but I went to him. And, and I him and I respect him, but I said, I need to talk to you. We went for a long walk 
And I said to him, he said, Tommy, what is it? I said, I think you're my father. He said, he stopped and he said, why would you say that? I said, because I don't look like my brothers and sisters. And everywhere I go, people say, hey, Pelosi, how you doing? And that's what I'm thinking. And I needed to talk to you. And we walked a little bit further and he said, well, you're right. He said, it's true. He said, now you can go and you can tell the world. It would ruin your mom and dad's marriage, but it, and it would ruin mine. And I said, I don't want to do that. He said, but you're entitled to do that. It was an affair they had and since passed, and it was over, and no one knew it. No one knew it but him and me and, and my mom, of course. Well, I, 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 I left him that day, and I kind of stayed away from him after that. I felt very uncomfortable around him. And I, I would never talk to anybody. I went in the Navy, and I spent four years in the Navy. But when I came home on leave one time, we got together again, and we became close. And then it became our thing, and I never talked about it to anybody, nor did he, because all the people were alive, you know. Now, when he was dying, you know, by the way, he had a band called Frank Pelosi and the Venetian Airs. He sang. He was a good singer and, the, and, the, and also a joke teller <clears throat> and also owned this tavern. So anyhow, when he was on his deathbed, I went to visit him and I'm laying there. And he's laying there and, and I'm sitting by his bedside. Everybody had left the room. And I told him um, that, uh, you know, we, we talked about it. He said, is there anything you want to say to me about our situation? I said, no. He says, anything you want to get off your chest and tell me anything you feel? I said, no. He said, no, no don't do this because I'm dying. He said, let's talk. I said, no, I'm telling you, I have no regrets whatsoever. I said, as a matter of fact, probably everything I am, everything that I, I've done in my life came because I came from you. So I have no regrets. And I said to him, do you have any regrets? The only thing I regret is that every time you're on TV, if I'm in a bar or wherever I am with people and you're on TV, I can't say to them, that's my boy up there. He said, that's the only thing that I, I regret. And I said, well, one day I'll receive an award and I'll accept it in your name. Mm. And he turned his head and tears were in his eyes. I'd never seen him. He said, I'd never seen him cry. And, and, and when he was seven years old, he came over on Ellis Island with his mom and his brother. His father had already been here. He came over on the SS Italia. And so when they offered me this Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award, I said, yes. And I accepted it in his name. I received yeah. the other side of the and I said, this is for Frank Pelosi, who came here when he was seven years old, right over there, you know, and, that, and, that. and so that's why that award meant so much to me. You know, there's something else that we dug up in our little research uh, department here that I know means a lot to you, and th it's this, and it's this, uh, the Chicago Theater, the marquee there. Tell us about that, especially yeah. in your, your hometown of Chicago, you know? Gosh, that, that's one of the highlights of my life. When I was a little boy, was once in a while, shoe shine box, take the IC, the Illinois Central, downtown to Randolph Street, and I'd go over by there and I'd try to shine shoes because they tip bigger down there than they did in my little in Harvey on the South Side. So, <clears throat> you know, I'd try to catch people either waiting to go into the theater or maybe coming out or waiting for a cab and I'd, and I'd, I'd try to shine a shoes. Anyhow, and for me to be flying back into my hometown and my name was going to be on the marquee, with Frank Sinatra, it was, everything came in full circle. It was just an, an, an incredible, incredible time. Uh, you know, they had spent $8 million renovating the old Chicago theater. And to, to it, just to perform there with Frank Sinatra was one thing, but Frank would come out <clears throat> after my show, they'd take a little intermission and Frank would come out and uh, without an introduction, he'd just walk out in the middle of the stage. He'd look around the audience and he'd say, this is, my kind of town, Chicago is, and the people would go wild. You know, it was such a special, special time. Mm. <clears throat> what uh, What was the response? You know, hometown boy, our our boy makes good from the parents, the family. You know, as they saw you leave the shack, leave you know the blue collar town, move on, never lose this, lose the sense of all of that and the understanding, appreciation of all of that, but but have all of this happen in your life. And when you would go back, not just to the hometown with the name on the marquee with Sinatra, but to the family, to the loved ones, you know, our boy made good. What was that like in terms of the sense of the, that understanding of, of their appreciation for everything you've done? Well, I, I mean, my brothers and sisters have always bonded. We've always, they've always been behind me, <clears throat> always supported me. 
at hard times, especially. And again, it wasn't overnight. It took a lot of a lot of years and a lot of struggle. I slept in a car out here in the West Coast, an old abandoned Nash Rambler uh, that, that the front seat came down. My wife and kids were in Chicago, and and uh, my wife wrote me a dear John. We ended up getting back together again. But she said, "This is your dream, not mine." And and uh, and and again, I hitchhiked every night to the comedy store, begging to work for free. So it was a lot of tough times. But yeah, a nice story <clears throat> about about going back. Um, my mom, when I was a little boy, we lived in a shack, like I said, and I sold newspapers. I would bring her this newspaper um, uh, every morning, at, at, at Chicago Sun-Times, that had in the column, it would say, the, the Ambassador East Hotel in Chicago had a number one booth. And whatever celebrities came to town, they'd say, seen in the number one booth today was Humphrey Bogart, or seen in the number one booth was Frank Sinatra, or, 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 or Clark Gable, whoever the star was in town. My mom would read the paper of mine, I bring a paper, and she attended bar all night long, and she would sit up in the morning, have a cup of coffee and a cigarette, and she'd say, oh, look, Tommy, look who was in the number one booth at the Ambassador East, uh, you know, Marilyn Monroe, or look who was in the number one booth, you know, um, you know, Susan Hayward, or whoever the star was in town. And I said to her one time when, when I was a little boy, I said, Mom, you know, you're a bartender, you should try to get a job down there at, that, at, at the Ambassador East, and maybe you could meet all these stars. And she said, oh, honey, they don't hire the likes of us down there. <laughs> they don't hire the likes of us down there. Now, years go by. I'm appearing at Chicago Theater. We're staying at the Ambassador East. And I take my mom to the pump room. And they, I said, I have lunch there. And they said, did you want the number one booth, Mr. Dreesen? I said, yeah, I want the number one booth. And I sat there with my mom. And I told my mom, I said, mom, remember one time you said they don't hire the likes of us down there but they let the likes of us sit in the number one booth and the next day the newspaper column it said seen in the number one booth was glenora dreesen and her son they didn't even say my name and, and my mom kept the column by her bedside before she passed away till she passed away mm, that's really amazing i mean the number one booth had such sentimentality involved with it to be able to be sitting in that Extraordinary. There's something else I wanted to pull up here too. Uh, you're an avid golfer. We mentioned that we were talking about that before we went live on the air. Tell us about this third best celebrity golfer and everything uh, that's tied to that. I caddied when I was a boy. Yeah. So I fell in love with the game. Yeah, I fell in love with golf and I caddied when I was a boy. But then I, I, as years went by, I, I couldn't play. I, I, you know, I was in the service and I came out of the service. I had married kids and working two jobs and, and, uh, Never got a chance to play much. And I started touring with Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy um, uh, had a golf tournament, the Sammy Davis Jr. Pro-Am in Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, the GHO, right. Yeah. Greater Hartford Open. So I would, I would, uh, 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 Sammy would go play golf and I'd go right around the cart with him. One day I was swinging the club. He said, you know, you got a nice swing. Do you play golf? I said, oh, I haven't played in years. I would go into Phoenix, Arizona and to perform. And in my dressing room, I opened my dressing room door. There's a brand new set of ping woods and irons with my name on the bag. Sammy bought me this set of clubs. Bob Hope invites me to the Bob Hope Classic. You know, Bob Hope was a, was we, a, I was a fan of Bob Hope's, but he was a fan of mine. He would take me places, do shows with him. And, and I really loved that, you know. And so Bob invites me to Bob Hope Classic. Now I get to tell you a great story. I'm on the first tee, I'm gonna play with Arnold Palmer. They have a, a pro, a celebrity, and two amateurs. Yeah, you know, a guy owned a, a car, a guy owned a car dealership, and, and an insurance guy. So I get on the first tee. There's thousands of people lining them. Oh my God! You know, I'm out of my element here. And I walk up, and I'm, I'm on the first tee. And one of the amateurs came up to me, who's going to play with me. He said, "Hi." He owned a car dealership in, in Michigan. He said, "Hi, I'm Hoot McInerney." I said, "Hi, Hoot. I'm Tom Dreesen." He said, "Nice to meet you, Tom." Sure hope we get a good celebrity. Last year, we got some guy I never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. that night at the banquet, we all performed. I told that I, I pointed them out, and the audience loved it. That, that they did. But anyhow, I started playing a lot of golf, and years go by, I played on a golf tour called the Celebrity Players Tour. Mm -hmm. It's basketball, baseball, football, hockey, tennis, and show business people that were 10 handicap or below. So it was Johnny Bench, Mike Schmidt, Mario Lemieux, John Elway, Dan Marino, Michael Jordan. We had 45 Hall of Famers. In show business, it was Matt Lauer, Brian Gumbel, me, um, uh, Smokey Robinson, Frankie Avalon, uh, Eddie Marinero, you know, mm. all those. And yeah. so 
and a guy named Jack Wagner, who who really won, he won, uh, he was the best celebrity golfer I ever played with that ever lived, I believe. Anyhow, <clears throat> um, so it, it, golf became <clears throat> not only a part of my my pastime, but a money maker. Because whenever I was at these golf tournaments, they would say, "Would you mind getting up and doing a few minutes at Bob Hope or whatever?" At the AT and T, Clint Eastwood's a good buddy of mine, and, and I, I perform at the AT and T every year. In that audience are Fortune 500 companies, yes. corporations. So the, you, you'd come off stage and some guy would say, I'm from Allstate. Here's our card. Can we give you a call? I'm from, you know, uh, we're, we're from the um, AT&T company or, or IBM. <clears throat> and I, did, I started doing a lot of corporate work because of that, you know. That's really, so really, really, really. <clears throat> now, you had this great relationship with you and Tim. And what was really, really interesting, I, I saw something where you had mentioned where uh, you brought Tim into – the whitest of neighborhoods and they fell in love with Tim and you together. And then he brought you into uh, African-American neighborhoods and they fell in love with you and Tim together. And you also have this really cool comedy album uh, that white boy is crazy. Tell us about that. Tell us about the, uh, yeah. the, the German keep that album cover. up. Yeah. Keep that album cover up. I'm point something out. Yeah. <clears throat> Everywhere I went, <clears throat> cause I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. You see those people in the audience, yeah. Every one of those were friends of mine that I grew up with. That's right. Gucci sitting right up front, who I talked about in my act for years and made him, made him, he was a big hit back home, you know. Uh, but Everett Nicholson is his real name, but his nickname was Gucci. I grew up a around a lot of black folks, so I played basketball on an all black basketball team. And I played football on an all black football team, and I wrote a lot of jokes about that, you know, about those routines. But when I started doing the Tonight Show and those shows, everywhere I went, white people would come up to me and say, do black people laugh at your material? Mm. Do black people laugh at your material? I got so tired of telling them that I worked yeah. all black audiences for years, what they call the Chitlin circuit. I got so tired of hearing that, that I went and I did an album in front of an all black audience. And whenever some people would come up to me and say, do black people laugh at your material? I'd pull out a CD and say, give me twelve ninety nine, and you can go home and find out for yourself, you know, but those are people from my neighborhood, you know, um, uh, you know, like I say, Gucci is brother Leroy, Tutu Brackens, uh, Tony, Tony uh, Salters, uh, uh, Jesse. Th those are all people that I know that I uh, that I, I grew up with, and, and I, I love them dearly. A lot of them are past now. Gucci's passed away too. Yeah, you know, you also uh, had said something about. I know somebody asked this question at one time. You know, somebody that says Tim Reed is awesome. Absolutely. Uh, what a sweet thing to do. I know proud of your award talking back that award that you got the Ellis Island um, Very precious um, There was an interesting answer you once gave that really stuck with me when somebody had asked something about um, There's writers who become comedians there's comedians who become Writers and the yin and yang of all that tell us about that well, it, 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 somebody once asked me in an interview, are you a comedian that's a writer? Or are you a writer that's a comedian? And I said, gee, that's a wonderful question. Because when I think about it, I'm a comedian who writes. I'm not a writer who's a comedian. Because I love stand-up comedy. I don't love writing. Writing is a task. I mean, I can do it, but it's a task. You've got to sit down and force yourself to write certain times a day. You know, you've you got to... It, 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 it's a task, but I'm, but I, I have a propensity for writing. I think it's the Irish side of me because I, 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 I wrote the book, you know, I wrote those stories. Um, but, but, uh, but I think it is what you, what you feel in your heart. You love to do. I love stand up comedy. I can hardly wait to get up. I don't go through all the anxieties that a lot of comedians go through uh, before they go on stage. I, you know, I, I love, like I say to you, I, I wrote this poem, the sound of laughter. I love to hear the sound of laughter. Writing is a job. By the way, I, like you, I MC. You know, I MC a lot of corporate events, you know, and I tell everybody comedy is a joy. MCing is a job. You know, when the corporate people hire me to MC, they want me to also do a comedy monologue within the confines of that. But the, the MCing, I get all the information prior to MCing. And I, and I say to them, okay, how, what do you want said tonight? And they lay it out. I say, okay. What speakers do you have? Okay. What do you have any videos? For? And I look over the whole evening and I say, okay, this should go first. That should go second. This should go third. <clears throat> so they have what they call continuity. And, and it's a job to get that done. Sometimes an hour and 45 minutes that they need done in an hour and 10, or you're going to lose that audience. 
you know, that's a job to do that. You know, uh, that that's uh, I, I emceed the Ellis Island Medal of Honor Awards for years afterward, as well as many corporate events. And 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 it's a, to be a good master of ceremonies. It's hard to find real good master of ceremonies. You know that. You know what I'm talking about. You do it. But um, it, 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 it it's again it's keeping that evening flowing. How many times you've attended an event and you say, "Oh my God, I'll never come back to this next year. This is a never-ending evening." By the way, Frank Sinatra hated those. He was very impatient. If they were going to give him an award, he'd say, "I'll do it if Tommy MCs." He'd always say that, right. and he called. He called me, you know, he called me the master, master of ceremonies, but only because I too suffered through those programs and, and I learned how to keep them moving, you know, um, and, and, and it's, 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 it's really a, an art form, a good master of ceremonies. It's, they're hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. How has comedy changed over the years from, you know, those early days and, and some of the adventures that you've had working with some of these greats and then just perfecting your art form? How has it changed uh, in, in certain ways? Like I know a lot of comedians say today, gee, we can't say this. We can't say that. We can't because there's so it's like all these restrictions and regulations and all these things now that sort of uh, limit just being free and comedic and reactive to whatever the heck's going on. Tell us how, how some of that has uh, changed and morphed over the years. Two major changes one is language there was when i <clears throat> everywhere i went in america um you know you know again how do you get on the tonight show that's where you had to go well you you're in business there's two words show business so business men and me said well how do, how do you get on the tonight show or other comedians you see if that's where i got to go to tonight show, how do i get on you watch those comedians you had to work clean you had the right material that could make grandma and grandpa mom and the dad mom and dad and the kids laugh and so that's the kind of material you had the right to get on the tonight show they didn't have cable television in those days when cable came along you could work as filthy as you wanted to work now i'm not a prude i'm a street guy i don't have a degree from academia i got a doctorate from the streets i could do a stag roast with the best of them and i've done stag roast but i couldn't i didn't think it was good money I, it wasn't a good business move in those days to work like that so i that's the dramatic change the language they use today and and, and women as well as men I mean, talking about every sexual function in their life and all that. And, and, and the kids of young kids today accept that because they started out going in the comedy clubs where that's the way the comedians talk. So they thought, oh, that's comedy. They never saw a Jack Benny or a Bob Hope or a George Burns. They never saw those comics that do an hour uh, without ever saying the word hell, you know. Um, I'll give you a quick funny story. A while back, I was at the Laugh Factory. <clears throat> and uh, trying out some new material in Hollywood, and there were two comedians around the corner, young kids, and they didn't know I was there. And I was working, I was looking at my notes, and I was around the corner, and they start talking about me. And my ears perked up, of course. This one kid said, "You know, Tom Dreesen's here." A young kid. So you know, Tom Dreesen's here tonight. And the other kid said, "Oh yeah, he's old school." And the other kid said, "He's old school. What do you mean?" He said, "Well, he doesn't use the F word." And the other comedian said, "He doesn't use the F word. What does he use for adjectives?" And I stuck my head around the corner and I said, adjectives. That's what I said, adjectives. You use the actual adjectives, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, but I mean, that, that's my point. That's one of the changes. The other change is, you're right. All of a sudden, the politically correct police coming into our lives, telling me, don't say this and you can't say that. You know, if you take a comedian and watch my hands, you say to a comedian, I don't want you to do this and don't say that and don't say this. And don't say that. And don't say that. What, what do you say I'm doing? I just put him in a box. If you put a comedian in a box, he's no longer a comedian. Right. Tell anyone, we have the First Amendment right. We can say whatever we want to say. You don't have to watch us. You don't turn us off. You can walk out of the room. But we have the right to say that. And we don't even know who you are, by the way, you politically correct police. You know, we know who the... We know who the Democrats are, the Republicans are. We know who the Independents are. We know who the Kwanis, the Moose, the Elks, uh, the JCs. We know who they are. We know who the Ku Klux Klan is, but we don't know who you are. And we keep apologizing to you for saying, saying what we have. A, millions of men and hundreds of thousands of men and women died so that we have the right to that first of say whatever we want to say. They died so that we have that right. You know, mm -hmm. and we're apologizing to you. How dare you? We don't even know who you are. So, um, uh, you know. If, if you if anybody gets a chance, I'm not going to give you the punchline. Go on the internet and say and look up Tom Dreesen uh, rants about political correctness. 
because there's a punchline at the end. Tom Reeson rants about food, and I don't want to give you the punchline here. So <clears throat> you're going to keep Really uh, beautiful comment here from uh, Linda in Florida. None of the comedians today even come close to you, Tom, or Tim Reed, Johnny Carson, Richard Pryor. We just had a dear friend of mine is uh, Rain Pryor, uh, Richard's daughter. I've known her for years, and she was on uh, as a guest, and uh, she lives in Baltimore, married with her children. She just ran for office recently, and she's wonderful friends with Richard Pryor Jr., too. He's a, he's a real cool soul. Uh, I could go on and on about all the greats. The main reason is because all of you never treated comedy as a job. It came natural to you all. It's, it's sort of within your DNA. And it really is. I mean, if you weren't doing comedy, uh, what else would, would Tom be doing? I'd probably be a drunk somewhere. I'd probably be. Yeah, I, I, I'm not being facetious. No, 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 I would have been so unfulfilled. I'd have been so unfulfilled. You know, um, you know, I, you know, when the comedy team split up, I'm sitting in a bar. After six years of being with Tim Reed, I wanted to be, I thought Tim and Tom, our act, Tim and Tom would become the, the num number one comedy team in America. I wanted that. That was my goal. <clears throat> and when T Tim was the one who split up the act, he uh, ran off with a, another woman. <laughs> I said, another with another. He ran off with a woman and, and ruined his marriage and everybody. He, he, since all that's been justified, but it just, it broke up the act. And um, I was sitting in a bar with my buddies. It was two o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I had two beers in front of me and, and people were buying beers back and forth. It's two o'clock in the morning. And I, I was always good at options. And I thought, okay, I could either get another black guy and do the same act, or I could get a job in a factory and make my wife happy because that's really what she wanted. Get out of show business. She hated it or I could go it alone. And I made up my mind sitting at the bar. I said, I'm going to go it alone. And I started thinking about the books I read, Positive Mental Attitude and everything. I said, you know, I, I, I'm, my goal, I want to get to the Johnny Carson show. I'll go it alone and I'll start writing material to get to the Johnny Carson show. And I remember a book I read called Positive Mental Attitude. Uh, and it said, if you, if you know what you want to do in life, and if it's a noble endeavor, then search your life. And see if there's anything in your life that can deter you from that noble achievement and then get it out. Right. So I, thought, and my, I said, what could stop me if I wanted to make it to the Johnny Carson show? I'm thinking, what could stop me? And I thought, alcohol. I love to drink. I love drinking beer with the best of them, you know. And I said, I quit. I put the two beers across the bar. My buddy who was 10 bar came up and he said, what are you doing, Tommy? I said, I quit. He said, done for tonight, huh? I said, no, I quit. He said, for tonight. I said, I quit. He said, yeah, right, I'll see you tomorrow night. I never touch another drop, you know, I, 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 until I achieve my goal. I was now a, a success doing all the shows. One night I went out with my wife. I said, I think I'll have a beer. I had a bottle of beer, and I said, you know, it just didn't taste the same. I haven't had a drink in years. And, and uh, it, it isn't that maybe I could have a drink. It's just that, you know, when, when, you, when you decide you find the work that you love, you know, and, and you, you, you just search your life, see if the same thing can deter you from that. You know, if there's something in your life, man, woman, or beast, you know, that deters you from noble endeavors, if they're noble endeavors, you know, then get them out of your life. You have that power. You know, and I, I'll, I'll close with this, and I got to go here pretty soon because I'm going to have dinner with a friend. But I got to close with it, that when I give motivation speeches, everybody, I say at the end, I say, everybody wants to know, what's the secret? What's the secret? There's right. a secret. What's right. The secret is you. You're the secret. It's all in here. You got it. Yeah. If you don't read about those who did and apply it to your life, you're the secret. You know, you know, you can be whatever you want to be. You have to get it to work. And, you know, again, the inner journey is more exciting than the outer journey. One more question or two more quick things before you head out. Um, when you look at all of this, I mean, this, this is resilience. This is stamina. This is blood, sweat, and tears. This is not a perfect roller coaster of just, you really gave it your all and continue to, and you bring so much joy to so many people, millions of people for decades. What are the things in your life, Tom, that continue to bring you the blessing and the joy and the inspiration to still do everything you do for the greater good and the pleasure of all of us? My children. You, I had a father that was not a good father. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. He just was alcoholic and, he, and and I 
if, if ever if something could be put on my tombstone, it would be I would appreciate it if they'd say he was a good father, he was a good dad. So I wanted to do good for them. I wanted them to be one day be proud of me that they, that after I'm dead and gone, that, that, that if my name came up, uh, they would say, oh, yeah, he made me laugh or he brought joy into my life. Because, uh, you know, I, like I said, I had a father who was drinking all the time. So it, my children are, are like, I love them so much. They're, they're gifts of God. They really are. And in and, and my last chapter in my book, you'll see how much of a gift of a God they were to me that, 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 that uh, when I needed them the most, they were there in the last chapter of my book. But so I think that's what that's what um, made me want to do greater things because uh, I wanted them to be proud of me. Isn't that beautiful? Did you did you also look for the the pride and acceptance of your father and of your folks too as you went along as, as you hope for your children to be proud of you? Were you always searching and hoping that your dad and your your family would be proud of you as well along the way? Well, I'll tell you, you know, my mom, of course, quit drinking toward the end of her life. And, 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 and you know, and, and she was proud of me. And I introduced her to Frank Sinatra. And she was so excited because she's was- in the band, too. And she, you know, uh, I, I remember that I, when I took her in the dressing room, I said, you know, to Frank, she was so nervous. And she said to Frank, thank you so much for taking care of my son. He said, my, your son takes care of me. And she got the biggest kick out of that. She thought that was so good. But I'll tell you, my in Chicago was the Illinois Fatherhood Initiative. Because how important are fathers in a home? I understand this, three out of every 10 white children born in America today are born without a father in a home. Five out of every 10 Hispanic have no father in the home. And seven out of every 10 African American have no father in the home. 7% of these crimes are created by fatherless teenagers. In Harvey, Illinois, Four percent of the children being born in 1960 were born without a father in the home. Today, over 70 percent. Uh, you know, the boys without a father in the home are five times more likely to commit suicide, ten times more likely to end up in prison. I mean, there's so many uh, to commit horrendous crimes without a father in the home. How important is a father in the home? And so that's what I, t- I talk about that, and I and I and and I, and and I think that that's the number one problem. I know where it began is too long to, to tell. I know how it all began because it wasn't always that way. Um, but anyhow, I know how it began, so I don't want to get on it. But how important is a father? My dad, I played a lot of sports as a kid. Yeah. My, my dad never came to any event that I played at. Not that I, I, I didn't feel bad about that. He just didn't do that. He went in the bars and all that stuff. And so he never saw me playing any sport. And in eighth grade, I was captain of the lightweight basketball team, and we, uh, I scored points in the game and put us into the finals. My sister Darlene went home and, and told my mom, and everybody's all excited about it. And, and we were going to play in the finals at the high school, even though it was an elementary school, they had the finals at high school. My mom went and got my dad out of a bar, and he had never seen me play. And he came to that game, and he was up in the stands, and that night we got blown out by about 30 points by another great team. I scored only two points that whole night. In those days, they didn't have a three-footer, I mean a three-pointer. But I fired one from about that far away. It was in the third quarter. I had not scored the whole game, and I only scored two the whole game. We just got run out of the gym. But when that ball went through that hoop, the first thing I did was look up in the stands to see if he was looking, and he was. And he had the biggest grin on his face that to this day, if I close my eyes, I can see his face right now with that big grin on his face. How important is a father in the home? How important is a father's approval of you? You know, that was that that that, that that's how important. I mean, that, that image is with me forever. Tupac, the famous, famous rapper who's no longer with us, he said, you know, that if I only had a father, he said, I had a good mom and she's wonderful. He said, but a man, only a man can teach you to be a man. You know, a man can only teach you about being a man. He said, even though my mom was wonderful. Barack Obama had many times said about a father in the home, and he's a good father himself, as you know. As you know. So, so anyhow, that, that's, that's beautiful. 
long answer to a short question. No, 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 no. Beautifully said. One other, you did say that you had a quick story about our beloved George Burns, who we show every night here on the show, that you had an opportunity to, uh, there he is. He sends you his love. <laughs> Tell us about the working with George Burns. Well, you know, I, I, again, his, his manager was Irving Fine, whom, who also managed Jack Benny. And Jack Benny was one of my heroes. And um, so I, I met Irving Fine and all that. And George, George, of course, I did the roast with him, uh, at the Dean Martin roast. We roasted him. And, and, and I told you a story earlier about me going back into his dressing room. And, and uh, oh, you know, I, 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 there's so many stories I could tell you about him. But, but just basically that he was a good, decent, honest man and a funny guy. He knew how to edit jokes. You know, a lot of times comedians write a joke this long, but he knew how to take the fat out of the joke and get to the punchline. Um, it, you know, I, I remember one time I did the Phil Donahue show and he was on, you know, um, oh, that's good. I, I like that comment too. Thank you, Linda. And, and uh, anyhow, but, but uh, he, he was on the Phil Donahue show and what the audience was all women in the audience. And, and they were talking about, Phil Donahue would start talking about his wife, Gracie. You remember Burns and Allen? They were the, one of the greatest um, um, comedy acts of all time, you know. But after, after she died, you know, he was talking about Gracie. And, and he said she had been dead about 15 years. And George said, I, I, and I talked to Gracie every Sunday. And Phil Donahue said, whoa, whoa, what? He said, I talked to Gracie. He said, you talked to Gracie? George, you know, she's passed away. He said, I know, I go to the cemetery. He goes to visit, right. And I go and I talk to her. He said, what do you talk to her about? He said, I tell her how the kids are going, how the kids are doing. He said, I tell her what's going on. In a business. And he said, and I tell her how much I miss her. Yeah. And there wasn't a guy in the house. You know, uh, That's the soul of, of a decent human being. And it came out to his, you know, it came out to, you know, and, and uh, anyhow. That's, Guess that's, what, Tom, Treason? That defines you as well. That defines you as well. You are really something uh, in, in so many different ways. And we could do hours of conversation. I know you have the dinner waiting, but I just want to thank you personally and, and professionally for, for spending the amount of time because I think you've reached people on levels that went even beyond what they might have ordinarily seen or known of you through your comedy, which goes, which cuts through ice. And to have come through the experiences early on, uh, growing up in, you know, uh, the Chicago area in Harvey, Illinois, in the shack and, and cutting through and, and still always remembering where you came from. But at the same time, uh, being able to work with some of the greats, becoming one of the greats yourself is an extraordinary and inspiring story for anybody that is thinking, you know what, I'll never be able to do this. This is not meant for me. I, I don't have a dime in my wallet. I don't, I, I you know, I'm in the shack. It's just not gonna happen. Your, your, your comedy is perfection. Your personality is extraordinary. The story of who you are, where you came from and where, what you've become without losing the sense of all of those early beginnings is so darn inspiring and motivating and empowering for so many other people on so many different levels. This was cool. This was an honor. This was funny as heck to have you on this show, Tom. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're welcome anytime. Um, the door is always open. I hope we get a chance to, you know, get together and, and break bread at one of these days. Uh, I, I really value the time you've spent, the stories, and uh, you're really something else. Oh, thank you so much, Jimmy. I, I, I enjoy doing it. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the plug for the book. Uh, the book is doing good, thank God, because of people like you who keep plugging it for me. And uh, and then, and hopefully I'll see you down the line. I hope you enjoyed your time with me as much as I did with you, Tom. Well, remember what Frank Sinatra said his very last song, the best is yet to come. You got it. Tom, thanks for everything. It was really a wonderful conversation. You're the best. And I really thoroughly enjoy it. And I'm honored to have you with us tonight. You take care and you be well. You too. And all the people who, who, who called in and wrote in, God bless you all. Thank you for your comments. I really appreciate it. Take care. You take care. We'll see you again. All right. Okay. Bye bye now. That is the one and only <laughs> Tom Grinson right here on the show. He gave us an extended amount of time. We really appreciate that. Some of the guests do that. 
uh, when we chatted before we went live on the air, he said, how much time do you have? You know, I have all the time, you know, that uh, you can just let it roll. And with some of our guests, that's exactly what we do. You know, some guests, they have a few things that they want to say. There's something that they just want to share with us. And then there's other things that they have to do. But uh, if you've noticed of late, some of the guests that we've had, have really been opening up. They've been sharing their lives. They've been sharing their stories in such an open way. And I, I, I hope that this show, that you're in the environment of this show with all its lights and levity and love and fun and levity and all the stuff that we do, uh, allows people to have a venue like that. Um, I mean, we're talking about their tasks. We're talking about their career. We're talking about their lives. And I hope that you're left with sense a little bit more deeply of who they are and why they do what they do and how they've been able to uh, navigate the craziness of life, which is something we've all had to do more than ever recently in the Western Pakistan. But um, maybe it inspires one of you or all of you to say, hey, you know what? There's something I've always wanted to do. And now during this time when we've all been, you know, sheltered in place kind of uh, I opened up the airwaves and created this show. I do this for a living professionally, but here we are doing it at a home studio. So you know what I mean? This, I, I think all of these guests we've had on are people from, from, from different backgrounds, different levels of success, who want to really tell their story and, and share their story. Sure, there's a book, there's a movie, there's a this, there's a that. But these conversations sort of uh, really get to the core. People that know me personally, especially know I like to get to the core. Because I think, again, life is short. And if you have an opportunity to really touch people's lives, as Tom said, and you might have been surprised, you probably saw him on Letterman and Carson and The Laugh Factory and, and movies and other things. And oh, yeah, he's very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you got a deeper essence of what motivates him. His early beginnings growing up in Harvey, Illinois, blue collar town. And, you know, working in bars and, and just sort of that atmosphere as a younger person. What it took for him to be able to power through and uh, never give in, never give up. Sure, he's had times where he just says where he had to live in a car. We had no money. I mean, uh, that happens. There's times when you're riding high and there's times when you're not. And life can do that to you. The, worth, the earth continues spinning, as he said. You know, and I mentioned the watch the clock the time keeps going. So one of the earlier things, and if you missed any of this, if you join us late, watch this again. You can see all of the shows on YouTube at Gym Masters TV, all the great guests, all the conversations. Last night we didn't have a guest, but we had two hours of fun and entertainment and comedy. We went on vacation. We did lots of interactions with our, our viewers, which I'm very big on. Uh, but to have somebody like Tom on our show and devote this amount of time um, is really beautiful. If he didn't want to devote that amount of time, he wouldn't know. Um, if some of these other guests we've had didn't feel comfortable in this atmosphere, they wouldn't sit around this long. Um, and I really appreciate that. And, and people are telling me that this gives them the feeling of resurrecting the lost part of the communication of uh, love. Caring for one another, the most part of kindness. Like some of the real veterans who I've always admired. I mean, I've always admired, I, there's people say I admire that are fantastic. Um, but I also harken back to admiring some of the people who sort of paved the way, like Dick Abbott's, Johnny Carson's, and you know, Letterman Francis. Well, um, you know, Leno, and, and, but also Dick Clark, and uh, Merv Griffin's, Mike Douglas's. You know, these, these folks who just really understood the art of communication, the art of levity, and the art of that conversation. It's not something you're going to see a lot of right now. So I like to blend in the current of today and the modern sensibilities of today, Jeffrey now, with some of the old school way and polish. I think people are really crazy that about that. People are looking for an old sense of that nostalgia, some foundations and grounding uh, with being current with everything that's going on around us. Um, 
it's a cool blend. So to have somebody like Tom on the show, it was really cool. It was a blessing. It's funny as heck. Feel free to, to go to his uh, website, tomdreason.com. And of course, uh, I'll show you the, again the spelling so you go to the right website, Tom Dreesen, T O M D R E E S E N dot com. You find a ton of his stuff on YouTube and, and everywhere else. Also, the book. There's two books actually. If you still want to get that other book we talked about earlier, Tim and Tom, an American comedy in black and white, that is Tim Reed, who you remember from W. Campy in Cincinnati, Tom, the very first interracial comedy duo ever um really fantastic time they had together and they really were breaking ground everywhere they went and it was really extraordinary and they went into white neighborhoods black neighborhoods uh every neighborhood you can think of and touched the lives of so many people and of course when he had that night tom on johnny carson look at johnny carson's face he's loving it um that was huge that was a huge time for him, as he described so eloquently on the show. His relationship all these years with Frank Sinatra, I mean, he opened for Frank Sinatra for year after year after year. Frank sort of took him under his wing. And, you know, hey, kiddo, I think you got something here. Let's, let's keep going forward with that. And uh, that's rare when you have those things happen in life. And he had that happen. And it's just been a joy and blessing. And he doesn't forget it either. He's somebody who understands what it's all about. He's been honored as a result of everything that he's done. And uh, and I tip my hat to people like that. Again, you know, somebody myself that who works in this kind of an industry, television, radio, media, on stage, entertainment, journalism, all of it. I tip my hat to people who, you know, trudge through because, I do the same thing all of my friends and colleagues, contemporaries do. You do and whatever you do that makes you happy in your life. There's the book, Still Standing, my journey from streets and saloons to the stage in Sinatra, Tom Dries with uh, Darren Grubb and, of course, Johnny Russo. And thank Johnny for putting this all together. He's a class act and really cool guy as well. In the book, forwarded uh, by David Letterman. He forged such a wonderful relationship with David. He was on David's show a multitude of times and even had the great honor. And, uh, you know, for somebody who's a host to hand off the show to somebody else, it's not always an easy thing. David did, and he got a chance to guest host on Letterman, which really was uh, another joy and blessing for him as well. So, again, the book, which I do encourage, is still standing. Tom Dreesen has been a pioneer of stand-up comedy again for 50 plus years. He's inspired so many younger comics of today. This is his inspiring story. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstores as well. And uh, you're going to really sink your teeth into this one, uh, not just for the nostalgia, but just it might even give you some motivation to think about your own life. Um, you know, and, and that's really what it's all about. Thank you. I appreciate that, Renee, uh, making the guests feel at ease talking to you. I've always heard that. I've even interviewed, uh, I'll give you a little, you know, opening up a little about some of my life as well. I've interviewed in my professional work psychologists and psychiatrists. Not, you know, I've interviewed every, everybody, but specifically like motivational people, like those psychologists and psychiatrists. In, in these interviews, 30 minutes in my professional work in television media. And they'll say the same thing. They'll say, oh, my God, I'm so nervous. Wow, I'm like, you were nervous. It didn't seem like you were nervous. And they're like, you don't know. I was sweating bullets. I couldn't sleep last night. I was so nervous. I, I'm rehearsing everything. And I said, don't, don't, don't rehearse. Let it flow. Let it just come out of you. You're a psychologist, psychiatrist. You're a life coach. You're a this scientist. You're, a, you're an expert in a particular area that you love and have passion for and that you've become an expert at. Don't. Don't get hung up on thinking too deeply about it. Just let it flow. You, you know what you're talking about. You do this every day. You're an expert. And they'll say after the interview, I feel so relieved. I feel so comfortable now. And they said, why? They said, because I made it easy for them, which is something I do unconditionally, like Tom with his comedy and, and really caring for people. I 
do the same thing as far as my work in, in telling the radio. I'm always conscious of making sure that the other person feels good about themselves, that they're lifted, that they're not going to be challenged, threatened, targeted. If you're here to, we're here to celebrate them and me and us together. That's what it's all about. And so when you have a psychiatrist in the interview say that to you, you made me feel like, you know, at ease. And I said, but you're the one who gets paid by the hour to make people feel at ease. And I think <laughs> at ease. That's a real feather. I, I really love that. It's really cool. It, it's a really cool thing. So, um, again, we love all of this. This is really terrific. And um, we're going to get ready to wrap up the show. Hope you guys are doing well. I know some of you are saying the audio is a little funky. Hopefully you hear every third word. And uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. And Linda says, I wish the children and young adults when I've heard Tom tonight, maybe they would get a clue about life. Well, if you know youngsters uh, that you think wouldn't really benefit from the show, just go to YouTube at Gym Master City, share the links, share this episode, share all the great episodes that we have. Again, if you've missed any episodes, here's what you have to do. If you want to watch this again, very inspiring to have a legend, uh, stand-up comedian, Tom Friesen on the show. I learned a lot too. Just go to YouTube, Jim Masters TV. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You know, buy his book, subscribe to the channel. It helps all of us. Um, when you subscribe to the channel, it helps those YouTube algorithms. And what it does when you subscribe to the channel, it boosts the videos higher, the episodes of this Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show series higher, so more people will get a chance to see it. If you're enjoying it, Share it so other people can see it as well. We'd love that. And again, this is your place for inspiring conversations, behind the scenes stories, levity, on location segments, great features, and so much. So it is just about 10 p.m. Eastern, our time. We thank once again our very special guest, the legend, uh, the incredible Tom Dreesen. He really is an amazing guy. He spent a lot of time with us tonight. I hope you learned a lot more about him. Really cool guy. And if you get a chance to ever see him in person as far as, you know, uh, comedy act or whatever, make sure you do that. You're going to feel really good when you leave. Like he said, release those endorphins. And uh, I know you do. I appreciate that. You're very good at sharing all of the shows and doing watch parties. I hope everybody gets a chance to do that. Have a great night. Good night to you as well. And uh, Carla in Brazil, thank you very much as well. You probably learned about this uh, American treasure on the reason here on the show. One more time, just want to remind you, his book is still standing, and it is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstores. And it's an extraordinary, extraordinary story. I think it's going to inspire you. Some of y'all make a great gift, too. All right, gang, more comments coming in here. Good night. God bless you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Love all the comments. Love all the lovity we had tonight. Tom loves that word lovity, he said, too. Um, it's really, really cool. Everyone have a great night. This was a, you know, a pretty extended show, but it's in the history books. That's for sure. And Tom, welcome back anytime. You've got a short week. So glad. Well, that's cool. You've got a short week. So, uh, yeah, because you're going on a vacation or something, right, too? And knowing you, Renee, you're going to be going on vacation, but you're going to still follow. You're going to follow it. You're going to check in. You might not be able to watch the whole shows, but uh, you're going to check in. Quickly, before we go, uh, I'm getting hungry. I'm Jim Town has to go. He went off to dinner. We appreciate him doing that. We've got some cool guests that you know I kind of want to miss that are coming up. Um, on Friday, we're going to work backwards. On Friday, see... On the bottom left, you know who that is? That's Stanley Livingston. Stanley Livingston. Yeah, the prolific actor, incredible guy. He's coming on. This is uh, my three sons, Frederick Murray and Don Brady and uh, William Demarest. And, uh, and there is uh, Ernie. That's right. Uh, you know the, the Livingston brothers? Stan is going to be with us on Friday from my three sons. Thursday, the brilliant and extraordinary actress, television, film, and so much more, and stage. 
Barbara Carter is going to be with us as well on Wednesday. Sean Wiley, uh, prolific dancer, choreographer, singer. He's in a very popular group, Under the Street Lamp. You've seen multiple PBS specials with them. He's a dear friend. He's coming on the show this Wednesday. And we're really, really looking forward to that. He's going to be with us. We're going to have a great conversation with him as well. And uh, he's just one of the good guys. You know what I mean? He's one of the good guys. He's going to be with us on uh, Wednesday. And then uh, on Tuesday, Matthew Arkin, who's another incredible actor, he's going to be with us on uh, Tuesday. And then, yes, that's right, Chip is, uh, what on Friday, Chip is uh, Stan Livingston. He's going to be with us on Friday. I mean, can't wait. This is Sean Wiley here. He's with us on Wednesday. He's got some really good stories to tell. And uh, Matthew Arkin, fabulous actor. He uh, comes from a legendary uh, family of actors. He's going to be with us on Tuesday, tomorrow night. Uh, really cool guy. He's going to be with us. Um, I hope you join us tomorrow because the guest that we have, Bob Hinkle, he has... He is a music industry legend. He has worked with like everybody you can think of in every level of music. Some of your favorite groups, some of your favorite artists. He's going to tell some amazing stories. He's, he's with us live here on the Gym Master Show tomorrow night. We're booked with guests all the way until September. Coming up later shows, Sean Kanan, who was AJ Quartermain on uh, General Hospital and so much more. Scott Schwartz, who is in uh, Toy with Richard Pryor and Jackie Gleason, also in A Christmas Story. He's the kid that got his uh, tongue stuck on the uh, metal pole. <laughs> He's going to be with us and so many others. Don't forget to smile, everybody. We're talking about levity and levity and light. Uh, that was a great theme for tonight's show with our uh, illustrious guest, Tom Reason. Make sure you smile and don't just smile yourself. Share the smiles with others. That's really, really important. And as I always say, my go-to place for calm and peace and serenity is the ocean, living here along the coast. I'm very, very you know, blessed to live here. We are blessed to live along the coast here. So if you can, get out in nature, especially during these crazy times. And if you can. a couple of things we do before we leave. What the heck, even though it's kind of late. Don't forget, I might be the star of the show, the host, the producer. We put all this blood, sweat, tears into the show, like Tom has. So many of you, people with tears, which is extraordinary comedy. You guys are the star of me. You know what I mean? This doesn't work. This is a two-way thing. It doesn't work unless you're there and I'm here. So none of us show up. We get dead air and darkness. We don't want to work with you guys. So you guys are the stars, all of you. And don't forget... To relax, breathe, laugh, like Tom said, release those endorphins. Try to think of the craziness and the funny things in life. Life can be really uh, quite funny when you think of the stupidity of it, the idiosyncrasies, the wackiness, the weirdness of it all. Be able to laugh at yourself as much as you might laugh at others. And laugh together, laugh together. Uh, and relax, breathe, breathe from the diaphragm. Take care of yourself. Love one another. Have some fun. We didn't do this earlier in the show, but we'll do it now to wrap the show. As we turn off the lights, the camera, the action, we say good night, everybody. Thanks for watching the Gym Masters show live. We appreciate you being with us. All your friends do as well. George Burns is here and Gene and everybody else. And we toast. You and you and you and you and you and you from all around the world. We thank you very much for joining us here on this extended episode of the Gymnasters Show Live. So we're going to wrap it up. A couple more comments coming in here. I say these shows are like marathon shows lately. And thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Love you. Appreciate you being here. See you tomorrow. Love hearing that. We will be here for you tomorrow as well. Great show. Great week of shows in store. Thanks for being with us on a Sunday, too. We appreciate this. Thanks for another great show, Jim. Bye, all. Thank you very much, Renee. 
And thanks to everybody. Keep spreading the word. We want to open up this show to more and more people um, because, again, it's a show that's uh, quite unique and there's a lot of lovely. I guess that's my new name. Lovely. You guys are stunning. I love this closing, Jim. Thank you very much. I know it's an extended close. My opens and my closes are kind of extended, aren't they? I think it's from years of being on temperature radio and just uh, filling it in, but it comes from the heart. Know that everything I do here on the show uh, comes from the heart. I know no other way. It's, it's what I do. I like to share this with you guys here on the show all the time. So, love you all. Thanks for being with us on the Jim Master Show Live. One more time, show you uh, the book, Tom's book. And uh, make sure you pick up a copy. You're going to love it. Still standing. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookstores. Thanks to my buddy, Johnny Russo, reaching out to me. And uh, I've been talking about the show. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us uh, on the program. We will be back tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Not pre-recorded, not perfectly edited. A lot of people do that on, uh, you know, YouTube and everywhere else. Just edit these images for for live. We're coming at you live and uh, we're interacting. So that's a wrap for tonight. Thanks to Tom for his time and thank you to you for your time. This is Jim Masters. Thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, we appreciate you being with us all around the world. Back tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, right here. Gym Masters Show Live, simulcasting on YouTube at Gym Masters TV and Facebook at Gym Masters TV. We appreciate it all. Stars, yes, not just one, two, three. We made it up to five stars from Linda. Now I'm going to be able to sleep well tonight. We got five stars. Ultimate way to wrap the show. Good night, gang. You're the best from all around the world. We appreciate it. Tom, really appreciate it. And all the guests love your comments as well. That's why I show them. I know you like them to be seen. Uh, puts a little tickle in your heart, and the guests love it. I love it as well. So keep it coming. See you tomorrow night. If not, watch the shows on the archives at Jim Masters TV. Give some love to the Facebook page at Jim Masters TV, Instagram, Twitter at Jim Masters TV, and YouTube. Subscribe. For all of us here, good night. Take care. Love you all. Have a good rest of your weekend. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you.